Abid Dafalla got a letter from a recruitment company late last year about work in the United Arab Emirates, he was delighted. He would be able to send money back home to help his family. He applied for a job as a security guard and was taken on by an Emirati company called Black Shield. But when he arrived in Abu Dhabi, he was in for a shock. Uh, we were taken to a military camp and given training on how to handle heavy weapons. Most of our supervisors were Emiratis. It was not the type of training you'd get for a job as a security guard. When I asked why we were being trained on heavy weapons if we were supposed to work as security guards, they said we could be sent to Libya or Yemen to protect Emirati installations. Abid is now back in Sudan after a campaign by the families of those who were recruited. In all, about 200 Sudanese men returned on Tuesday and immediately went to the UAE embassy in Khartoum to stage a protest outside. They say hundreds of their fellow Sudanese are still either in the Emirates at training camps or in Libya. The recruit this is not a loophole. This is how we make coffee on Sabbath to not transgress. Take a look. We pour the coffee or put the coffee in the cup, but we cannot pour the water directly on it. So we have another cup that pumps. We don't use the electric presser or dispenser. We pump it out. This water has been heating for a long time. We take this water and pour it over into that cup of coffee. And from there, if you want, you can pour your sugar inside. One, two, I'm extra sweet. Three, that's not a biblical commandment. You mix, I'm Yisrael Chai. Whoa, that's hot. Now, the reason is, is because we don't cook on Shabbos, pouring boiling water onto these coffee kernels, if you call them. That's cooking. Halacha says, Jewish law says, that the pot that the water was boiling has the power when it's poured to actually cook. And we don't cook, so we pour it into another cup. From this cup, the second cup, we can pour it in and thereby making sure we don't transgress a biblical commandment. A lot of these are not loopholes. In fact, mo all of them are not loopholes. These are parameters in order not to transgress a biblical commandment. The Jewish... Peace and blessings to everybody. How are you? Welcome to another episode of the State of the Community. Today we're going to be talking about Obey the Ruler. How's everyone doing? I hope, uh, yeah, I hope everyone is hearing me well. Please let me know about the quality of the stream. If you guys can see me, hear me well. And uh, yeah, well, I just started out with some somebody playing lawyer with God. You know, he outsmarted God. I love when people do that. Because you know what? In Islam, it's haram to murder somebody. If I take a knife, right, me taking a knife and stabbing somebody with the knife, that means I murdered him, right? But if he happens to fall on a knife, then it's not really my fault. I'm not the one who stabbed him, right? So if I hang a knife on a door and when the door opens and a knife falls on him, he kind of killed himself. So obviously I didn't kill him. And this kind of mentality is what we've been dealing with for a very long time. Where everybody's playing uh, uh, lawyer with God. Uh, salam everybody, I see you. Awesome. Alhamdulillah. Uh, salam alaikum. Salam from Germany. Salam from Netherlands earlier. Hi everybody. Okay, so today I'm going to do what we usually do. I'm going to discuss the topic that I want to talk about, uh, about exposing some hypocrites and just hypocritical uh, understandings. And then, inshallah, after the the uh, a few after talking about the topic, we can have a few questions and answers. If you have any questions, and uh, I'm I'm happy everybody's here. Okay, so we're gonna begin. So recently, as you could see, there's a lot of issues that are happening in the Middle East where people are always very, very um, outright and very in your face that you shouldn't criticize rulers that there is no example in the predecessors, the first three generations, the, the Salaf, as they say, you know, the three guide, rightly guided generations. There was no example of anybody uh, talking about the, the ruler in a negative way or rebelling or, or, or saying certain things. Now, the weird, my first question is, what happens in the fourth generation? Like, were they all like, 
good guys for three generations and the fourth generation they just became like losers overnight or is that when lying started to happen or is it because now you've started to write things down now that we have hypocrites and liars but before that it was impossible to have liars and hypocrites but regardless so they always like to use religion as a political mean to shut you up now i'm gonna play a few clips of these Scholars, these scholars are obviously hired by the government. These scholars are living in the Gulf regions. And mind you, I know how because I talk about the Gulf, because last maybe about a century, there's been a, a fight between the Iran. Uh, it's a sectarian fight between Iran and Saudi Arabia, where Saudi Arabia wants to, uh, well, first it was promoting Wahhabism, which was technically a an extremist ideology of Sunnism, but God knows best, uh, even if it's not an extremist, it's a, it's a definitely um, uh, very rigid form of Islam. And then from there, they moved on to Salafism. And then Iran, obviously, was Shia. I don't support either of them. I'm not a sectarian. I like to talk about the truth. And the problem is because of these elites and the higher ups, they are causing corruption in the land. And the people in the Middle East, and now it's kind of spreading away from the Middle East, they're suffering. So we need to be able to understand on how to deal with these rulers because obviously they keep telling you, you cannot, you cannot rebel against the rulers you cannot talk bad about them they get to do whatever they want as long as they're muslim as long as they're praying it's all good so let's start with a few clips on what we usually hear from these people now at the beginning i, I just made a small clip on what was kind of happening in sudan with people with sudan but let's, let's go with our favorite uh you know dawa people that like to talk about these kind of topics so we'll start with one of the people that you might, he, he has a problem finding where Mecca is. But uh, this is Shamsi discussing this very topic. In the best manner. Because Does it also show how Islam looks to rectify the society? Islam shows us to rectify yourself and rectify society in the best manner. Because if you know you're going to rectify something by causing evil, greater evil, you don't do it. Huh? As they say in, my, in back home, they say, someone wants to build a house in a city. So why did he destroy the whole city just to build one house? <laughs> so he destroyed the whole city for one house. For this so this is their usual tactics. It's like, well, if you're going to incite rebellion and you're going to incite, incite a revolution against these leaders these so-called muslim leaders then you're going to bring harm to the muslims okay now here's the difference so i would rather go through harm for a whole year rather than going through abuse for the next 10 years where if anyone who is stepping out of line regardless if it's religious or not they their families and everybody around is completely disintegrated that they're going through tortures, that they're going through a lot of abuse. All you need to do is go through political jails in Egypt currently. You should go through see the jails in uh, in Saudi Arabia where you will find your scholars, where you can go to the jails in Syria and you see the abuse and the torture that people are going through. You could also see that how the people are hungry because these rulers, they want to go through uh, Western understandings and enforce usury on everybody else. And we have to keep everybody poor because that way I can keep my seat. And let's not talk about the relationships with the West and the Zionist systems and all that. So, no, I, I'd rather go through a, a year of pain, two years of pain, five years of pain, and then save many generations after me from a lot of things that we've been enduring for the last 50 years or 60 years under these people. So it's, it's a very weird, weird uh, understanding or a very weird way to say well no 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 it's just because other people will get hurt and don't do it guys don't go to jihad you might get killed oh, oh guys don't speak out the truth because you might get hurt and other people might get hurt just be quiet like you know uh, you know if you're in the corner and the person's about to abuse you just just take the abusing you don't want to cause more pain Oh, is, is Israel, are the Zionists really abusing uh, Palestine for the last 70 years and they're getting, they're getting really hurt? Well, maybe they should just be quiet and just accept their fate. They, they should just lay down and, and, and be docile and that way they don't get hurt. So I don't know what Islam they're practicing, but this is not definitely not the Islam that we understand where we don't, we, we're not here for this worldly life. So from what I understand, 
and again, I'm not a Shia, and this might sound like a Shia trope, but the Prophet, peace be peace and blessings upon him, Prophet Muhammad, he sacrificed his family even when he was in the grave. So after he, he, he left this world, his grandkids, his cousin, his daughter, and some of his wives went through some terrible pains because of the religion that he was preaching. They were murdered. They were killed. They were annihilated because they wanted to speak the truth. So, yes, it wasn't inciting rebellion and inciting revolutions, but we've always been um, abused and hurt for speaking the truth. And it's easier, it's easier, it's much easier to just paint somebody as a Muslim, right, and say that I'm obeying him. But that tyrant, all he wants to do is abuse the world, corrupt the world, and build his empires, and not really care about what the book of God is saying and the word of God. So let's dive into another individual, which this is going to be in Arabic with subtitles, that he's going to give you a different approach on why rebelling is completely wrong, and that uh, that people have been inciting rebellions on who these people are. So this is a, a scholar not a scholar, but yeah, he is a scholar from the Salafis who's in Saudi Arabia. And we can both hear what he has to say. وقد منع من المملكة العربية السعودية وقد رد عليه الدكتور فهد بن سليمان بن إبراهيم لفيد وقدم له الشيخ صالح الفوزان. Okay, so it was very simple that he is saying that anyone who is promoting the Arabic Spring, those people are deviants. Anything to do, sorry. Let me stop this. So anyone who is promoting this Arabic Spring and anything that has to do with revolutions in the Arab lands, this person is definitely out of the religion. This person you shouldn't listen to. And here's books even talking about uh, anyone who's saying to revolt or rebel. Now, there's a little history that we're not going to get too much into. There is this organization that's called the Muslim Brotherhood. I'm not one of them. I'm not, I don't relate to any of that stuff. But there is a history. So the, the Brotherhood, they are more geared towards an Islamic politics. So they want to set up a state in regards to where it's run by what they would consider Islamic law and Islamic politics, which would include severing ties with the West, severing ties with the Zionist state, uh, having more so uh, an independent economy based on actual currency, no more interest rates, no more central banks with. So they wanted to m move towards what they would understand as religion. Now, the Gulf states, they have a problem with this because the Gulf states obviously have business and diplomatic ties with the U.S. and Israel and the Zionist states for a very long time. And they've been always trying to push more of a moderate Islam with secular politics. Secular politics is based, if you're a religious country, it's going to be sectarian politics. So Sunni versus Shia, uh, like this sect against this sect, and I'm going to promote my sect because if I'm promoting my sect, then I'm the one who's controlling the books, I'm the one controlling the narratives, and I'm attaching it back to God. So I'm using God as an excuse for me to do whatever I want. And if you don't like it, then I have the God-given right to remove you out of existence because I'm the one who's dictating what God has said and what God hasn't said. And this is something that you clearly see, A, with the Zionists, and B, now with a lot of Sunnis and Shias, where the words don't mean what they actually mean because they want to make the definition of the word so that they do and justify all their actions. Like the word anti-Semite. Anti-Semite doesn't have a clear definition because it's got nothing to do with you being a Semite. There's a lot of Semites in the world, you know, you can have a Semite language, you can be from the Semite race, the Israeli race, but no, this, they want to make it about Jews. And an Israeli, a child of Israel, has to be a Jew. So they're playing with the words that doesn't make sense. And now they do the same thing with the word Kafir, for example. So they want to define what Kafir is. And that whatever they want to give you as a definition of Kafir, it doesn't, it doesn't really align with what God has said in the book. But here's the problem. Now, you, as an individual, you cannot understand what the book is saying. You don't know what the Qur'an is saying because you do not have the authority to speak upon it. And, uh, uh, sorry, I, I am having a 
a, a, an issue with my fan here. But uh, what I was going to say is that since you don't have the authority to speak about the Quran, you can't really quote verses. You can't reject what people are saying because of what verses you have said. We get to tell you what the book is saying. We get to tell you what the words mean. And if you don't like it, you're in trouble. You go to jail, especially if you're a scholar. Okay, so now we've already established two things. One, right? They they saying that it's a greater harm to to rebel than it is for you to be. It's better to be docile to rebel because there's a harm factor. The second thing is that anyone who's causing a rebellion, these people are deviants. They're what they would call khawarij or people who have technically left the fold of Islam and they have labels as you're a person who's a, a health a dog of hellfire and all this other nonsense of these labels that they put you because they get to to, to say who's kafir and who is it you can't now the third one that I want to show you is how they twist narratives to protect their interests without being very clear with what is being said because they need to justify what they're doing and after I'm going to show you what like the bare minimum of what they really present to the public because this is their talking points that they keep repeating i'm going to break it down so that you could see how it's a complete farce okay so now here's our uh favorite uh neighborhood hero uh the one that is against anything to do with palestine and he's going to talk about dealing with the rulers you know, it's very sad that some Muslims, they think that the sunnah is only when you wear your slippers and how you take a shower and how you do ghusl and how you greet your brothers and sisters. But wallahi, the sunnah is much greater than that. It's a guide to life. And it taught us from the smallest things in life to the biggest things in life. Now, let me speak generally. And I think you're smart. You'll understand what I mean. You might find so-and-so country, Muslim countries, who are doing things that are against Islam, against the Sunnah. They're spreading maybe some sins. So we as Muslims, how do we deal with these things? Do you think the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell us, didn't teach us this? Wallahi, this is an underestimation and I might say even an insult to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ if you think that the Prophet didn't teach us clearly what to do in these kind of situations. There are over 80 hadiths talking about such scenarios. And one of them is in Sahih Muslim. Hudayf ibn al-Yaman came to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and he asked him. He said, Ya Rasulullah, inna kunna bishar, faja Allahu bi khayr, fa nahnu fi. We were in jahiliyyah and Allah revealed to, to us this, this Islam, this religion. And now we are in it. Is there evil after this, Ya Rasulullah? He said, yes. Then he said, is there goodness after this evil, Ya Rasulullah? He said, yes. Then he said, is there evil after this goodness, Ya Rasulullah? He said, yes. Then Hudayf ibn al-Yaman said, explain to me, elaborate please. This is very interesting. Listen to what the Prophet ﷺ said. يَكُنُوا بَعْدِي أَئِمَّةِ لَا يَهْتَدُونَ بِهُدَاي وَلَا يَسْتَنُّونَ بِسُنَّتِي There will be rulers coming after me, ruling these Muslim countries. They will not follow my guidance and they will not apply my sunnah. وَسَيَقُومُ فِيهِمْ رِجَالٌ قُلُوبُهُمْ قُلُوبُ الشَّيَاطِينَ فِي جُثْمَانِ إِنْسَ They'll have hearts of the shaytan. Look how extreme this is. But they are in the body of a human being. Hudayf ibn al-Yaman said, this is, this is scary. He said, what should I do, Ya Rasulullah? If I see this, what should I do? The Prophet said, تَسْمَعْ وَتُطِيعْ لِلْأَمِيرِ You listen and you obey to your ruler. Even if he beats you, even if he takes your money, beats you and takes your money, you listen and you obey. Okay, enough of his garbage. So he plays a lot with the words. The first thing is, the oh, well, how, how do we know what to do with a tyrant? This is his question. So the way that he answered is, well, there's how dare you like think that the prophet and his sunnah and his tradition and what he told you that he wouldn't tell you how to deal with this. Well, there's 80 hadith. Okay, how many verses of the Quran? There isn't because the Quran is telling you to deal with corruption head on, that God doesn't like corruption, that God doesn't like tyrants, that God doesn't like those that force people into things. God likes a unified Muslim community. God wants us under one leadership. God doesn't want 30 leaders. So, but let's put that to the side. Then he goes on to this uh, hadith in Muslim. Look, 
I, as you guys might know, I, I'm not a person that dives into hadith as religious guidance for me to find uh, like gems for me to forbid and to allow things because this is not what my life is about. My life is about the Quran. But let's let's investigate the hadith that he said. The first thing that he said that the Prophet explained to the man that, that there's going to be a time where there are uh, imma, leaders, okay? Now, the word leader here, a'imma, he put it as rulers. That does not, that's not true. Because you have an imam in a church, uh, in a mosque. You have an imam in your community. You have an imam in, in certain settings. Every, there's leaders everywhere. There's imams in your business. There's imams in many things. But then later, when the Prophet said, you listen to your amir, right? He went and used the word ruler again. But amir is different than imam. Okay, because under an emir, there might be many imams, but there's still one emir wahid. Like there's one single emir. And, and the proof in the same hadith is the prophet, or well, not the prophet, whoever wrote this words, they put, and let's say that, let's allegedly, allegedly the prophet said this, peace and blessings upon him. He pluralized uh, the leaders, but he, sing, he singled the, the emir. Now, that means that the person who's reading, leading me would be the Amir al-Mu'mineen. He would be from me. If he needed to beat me and take my money, is because he's fighting people like these a'imma, the hypocrisy that's within the community. Now, the, even the worst part is that he went back and said that we have to obey these a'imma. Does this man not read the Qur'an? Like, one, the man said, oh, I'm scared of what you told me about them having devils in their hearts that these are shayateen and ins, these are the devils of humans. Well, God tells us, don't be scared of the devil. The devil's plan is weak. But here the man is saying, oh, I'm scared of the devil. Be scared of the devil, guys, is what the message is. So because you're scared of the devil, be docile and, and, and just hear and obey. Don't hurt me. I don't want to be hurt. But the worst part is, he said to obey them. There's a clear verse in the Quran that the, the devils of the humans and the devils of the jinn, they inspire each other to argue with you and to delude you. And if you obey them, you are a mushrik. So is the prophet going to order his people in disbelief? Listen, to obey to the devil? When God made it very clear, you don't obey the devil. You don't obey the tyrants. You don't obey hypocrites. You don't obey disbelievers. So he went and made the imma uh, who are devils as their leaders. This is, not, uh, this is not heard of. This is incorrect. This is not proper aqidah. So they are go twisting these own verses, this hadith that they wrote. They want to explain it as they want because there's no consistency in those hadith. That's the problem. But if you look at the book of God, the look the book of God is clear about tyrants and 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 how people are supposed to handle tyrants. Now, <clears throat> we've established three things. One, you cannot you cannot create a rebellion. Okay, you cannot incite a rebellion. And you cannot support a rebellion. That's the first three parts. This is what this uh, Faris, who's a government agent, keeps telling to people. So now we need to find consistency with their methodology. If this is what the government is telling him to preach about this, and the and the people in in uh, who are supporting the Gulf rulers are doing this, then let's do it. Let, let's understand if this is what they truly believe in. Now, I want to show you Exhibit A. Exhibit A is uh, Libya. So, Arab nations strike Libya in a surprising, surprising the U.S. This, meant, this means that the UAE, with the help of Egypt, because Egypt just provided them the airfield, but the United Arab Emirates have launched airstrike against Islamist allied militia battling for the control of Tripoli. They were not defending Gaddafi. They were defending the people that they wanted to put in control. So anything to do with a group that wants to set up a Sharia law, Sunni Sharia law, not the, not the crazy ISIS because that's Israeli product, but any group that came up that wants to establish Sharia law properly, they were always fought by the Gulf states. They were always fought every step of the way by the Gulf states. So this is where they were targeted. And now... United Arab Emirates is not supporting Qaddafi against the rebels. They were actually supporting someone else. 
Now let's 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 not stop there. This is them breaking their first rule. This is not, and this is, was what in the last ten years or so, the Arab Spring, thirteen years maybe now. Now, the next part, Egypt also went through its Arab Spring. Because of its Arab Spring, they the the Egyptian population themselves went through the revolution. They rebelled and they put Mursi, who came out without the blessings of the West nor the blessings of the Gulf, but the people democratically put Morsi as the chair. Morsi, unfortunately for those states, is from the Muslim Brotherhood. This is what they would qualify as terrorists. Now, the West and, and Britain and Europe, they don't qualify the Muslim Brotherhoods as terrorists, but only the Gulf regions, they qualify them as terrorists. So this was a big no-no because Morsi is going to break all the ties with Zionist state and he's not going to support the Zionist state and he's going to su support the Palestinian state and he's not going to work nicely with the, with, the, uh, with the Gulf states. So what did the Gulf do? Well, it's very clear that the Gulf states, they decided to fund, okay? They wanted to fund one of the generals... Uh, that was under Sisi, who, uh, sorry, who worked for Morsi, Muhammad Morsi, they gave him the money to start a rebellion, to revolt against the elected, democratically elected leader of Egypt. They gave that money so that he would go ahead and start that revolution. Who did they give the money to? To Sisi, the current president of the, uh, the current president of Egypt. So now this is now them actually causing a rebellion against a Muslim leader. Now you can even see here where the king, the Saudi king, backs the Egyptian military. This is when he's because uh, Sisi was controlling the military, Morsi was controlling the government. The Egypt military is technically stronger than the government in Egypt. So every time there's a coup, it's always the military taking away the president and putting military law until a new president comes, something along those lines. But now. They funded the military for them to start a revolution to remove Morsi, okay? And here in Al Jazeera, when they wrote their paper, uh, we could clearly see it said that um, they, Saudi Arabia, along with Kuwait, also welcomed the July 3 army coup that ousted Morsi, Egypt's first elected leader since, since an, uh, a popular uprising in 2011 that too toppled Mubarak. So, by Arab state... Arab states of the Gulf, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain have separately voiced support for the deadly assault on Morsi's supporters, saying it was the state's duty to restore order. Sorry, I'm saying. So they incited a rebellion. They fought the people who were fighting for the truth, the ones that are trying to support their current government. And they went with it, with the killings and the extra harm and causing all these problems to put somebody. And this person right now, Sisi, he is jailing anything and anyone that speaks about Islam, just so you know. So he has built a million, a million people prison that they call it the Scorpion prison, prison, where anybody of a political like sense of something, they would put him in this jail and they would keep turning him around with no justice, with no any 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 form of proper uh, indictment, case files, lawyers, none of that. They just put him there, they torture them, they hurt them for many years and they keep revolving them in these jails. So they're stuck. And anybody who speaks about CC is going through in, in, in that position. Anybody who wants to promote a form of Islam that they don't agree, they put into that, uh, into, that, uh, into that format. So it's very deadly and it's very hurtful and it's punishing the Muslim community. This was funded by these Gulf rulers that said you can't revolt. Okay, so now we have two case scenarios. Let's continue and see if there's any other case scenarios recently where uh, they incited or caused or supported a rebellion as they said that you're not allowed to do that. Now, we had a situation in Syria. Syria right now is in very dire decision, in a very terrible place. Syria, unfortunately, was attacked and targeted by the United States and targeted by Israel. <clears throat> alongside with Qaddafi and Egypt, uh, Mubarak. 
they were it was a clear target i'm not an assadist i think assad is a crazy man i think his father was a crazy man but the way the syrians dealt with assad is they ignored him because there isn't much you could do because we, there was no outside support there was no need to revolt or re because this is not how things were dealt with with syria we understood this not because of religious context is because the way that you're handled in syria is unlike the other places anywhere in the middle east the brutality and the shame and the hurt that the the syrian regime can do on a person is unmatched and it's all quiet hush hush so you can have your son kidnapped to you and every week you'll only get one finger of him sent to your house they don't want money they don't want anything from you they don't even want you to see them or talk to them or say sorry apologize they want to torture you because of what you said and this will on, will be ongoing for a whole year every day you get a small part of your child and then guess what then after they're done with that they'll start with somebody else or they'll come for you and they'll starve you to death as soon as about to die they'll revive you and they'll keep killing you time and time again just so that you spoke out they would put a picture of whoever the president is right now and tell you bow down to your lord bow down to your god how dare you speak about him bow down to your god and they'll put a gun to your head and as soon as you do it you're shot so this is the people that are sitting as leaders that we're not allowed to rebel against so united states and, and oh by the way don't don't ever think that the gulf regions is in any better condition just because they're not going through a revolution if they did go through a revolution they would do what saddam did they would do what uh assad did they would do what libya did they would go bomb their own people they would jail their own people they would torture their own people they're not better they're not going to be like oh does my people want to change do they want a revolution i'll step down from the chair and i'll let somebody else take control absolutely not a single chance in 10 in in 10 worlds after this they would not step down politically they would not give up the leadership they would not give up their kingdoms they would not give up their immoral they would kill everybody and anything and keep their chair they would kill their whole population if they have to just to keep their chair so it's not about Assad and not Assad. so we had the united states who are they backing the syrian rebels interesting and kurdish groups and then we had iran okay so i guess iran is on the menhaj even though they're shia because they're backing up the uh, the well Hezbollah who's backing up the Syrian and the Assadists so they're they're kind of like defending the Muslim leader who's not a Muslim leader but that what well, that's what they call the Muslim leaders so Iran was actually doing the part that Saudi Arabia was supposed to do but that's fine who is next we have Israel well how they fight in Syria oh the Israelis the Zionists they were helping the Syrian rebels isn't that interesting and then we have Saudi Arabia Saudi Arabia would obviously help the uh the assad right no they actually helped the rebels they helped incite the revolution and to carry on the revolution saudi arabia would buy weapons from europe right and then they would transport them to the syrian rebels through jordan so jordan was complicit in inciting this revolution and this was all very well documented what can you do because you can rebel in other countries because those guys are not muslims we're the muslims you see what i'm saying it's okay to incite rebellions in libya in in saudi uh, in, in egypt in syria uh, and you go on right but not in our countries because we have sheikhs saying that it's haram you can't speak about them so this is where saudi arabia's role was where was russia's role russia was actually more on the menhaj than what the other countries were he was supporting he was supporting the elected muslim ruler of syria so i guess the christians the crusaders the russians they were more sunni than the sunnis at this point and let's see the turks who actually started the free syrian army also a muslim region they also what incited the rebels they gave the rebels the weapons they gave the rebels the communication they gave the rebels the the freedom to start this war okay so obviously there has to be someone who's going to be more on syria's side that is a sunni right uh no we have qatar that's also supporting the syrian rebels so i i, I think now we've covered three things they they themselves are rebelling and causing rebellions like they did in libya they themselves are supporting rebellions uh, they starting rebellions like they did in egypt and now they're supporting rebe rebels in syria but it doesn't even stop there right they make it very clear 
that they want to topple what they would consider their enemy. The reason why Assad was a problem is because of the Zionist state. Assad would not allow a certain normalization with Israel, not because Assad doesn't want to make ties. It's because of what happened with his father and what happened with Saddam. So there's a small history that I don't want to get into too, too much, but they cannot make a peace treaty with Israel, Zionist state, the same way the Gulf are so willing to do it, okay? Lebanon is on the edge too, but Syria and Russia, there's a history with the Zionist state, specifically where they're not going to make the peace. And this is why they never talk about the Occupy Golan Heights, because there was a lot of backstabbing that happened there. But that's a whole story for a whole different day. And thank God, because he's the one who's revealing these things for the people so that they know what they need to do. Now, so they incited... Uh, they put someone who would be very well, officials inside the Central Intelligence Agency knew that Saudi Arabia was serious about toppling Syrian President Bashar al-Assad when the Saudi king named Prince Bandar bin Sultan al-Saud to lead the effort. So they're causing revolutions, they're causing all these problems, they're talking all this nonsense, and you can't talk about them. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this is called hypocrisy. This is called major hypocrisy. So why is it not on their turf, but on everybody else's turf? Would you like to talk about another issue? Okay, so now we understand that there's a sectarian war between Iran and Saudi. And Saudi is the, the kingship for the Gulf state because of the money, not because of anything else. They actually hate each other. Qatar hates Saudi, Saudi hates Emirat, Emirat hates Saudi, Saudi hates Qatar, Kuwait hates them all. They all hate each other, but they have to stay just kind of working together because of the money. So it's like, it's like, you know, they smile at each other's faces. As soon as they leave the room, they, they, they just talk negatively about each other because it's just about the money for them. So you think that their hearts are one, but their hearts are divided, as God has said. And they don't fight you together. They, they, they only fight you when they, they, they know that they're going to, they think they're going to win. These are the signs of hypocrites. These are the signs of losers. These are the signs that would want to back up the Christians, the, the Jews, and the Zionists that want to fight the Muslims, not the people that want to keep the peace. But now that we know that about the sectarian war between Iran and Saudi, uh, Lebanon is clearly a proxy for Iran. So how does Saudi want to deal with Lebanon? They want to bankrupt them. Lebanon has been a very bankrupt country for the last four or five years as Hezbollah kept getting stronger and stronger. This is why there is no government in, Saudi, in, in Lebanon. They will not allow the economy to go down as long as it's an Iranian proxy. It's the same thing with Syria now because they're becoming Iranian proxy. This, ladies and gentlemen, this is the definition of terrorism. For me to get my political way, I will make your population suffer. I will keep your population broke. I will keep your population dying and hungry until they rebel against you and rebel against the thing that I don't like. And I will use my propaganda to say that this is the reason why you're broke. Hezbollah is the reason why you're broke. Hezbollah is the reason why you're broke. You should take your Hezbollah out and then maybe the money shows up. Again, I'm not a Shia. I'm not a supporter of Hezbollah. I'm, not, I'm a supporter of the people who want to fight against the enemies of Islam. That's who I'm a supporter of. Okay, I'm a supporter of the people who want to fight in truth. I'm the supporter of the people who want to say the truth anywhere you are in the world. So they're keeping Lebanon broke, hostages, the population is hostages. Syria now is having diplomatic ties with the Gulf states again because of Russia. And now the country is broke, the country is hurt, the country is bombed, and they still didn't remove their target, which was the Assad regime, because to us and to everybody else in the region, we understand that this man's been a drug dealer for the last 30 years. We're not going to go up against the mafia because he's not a Muslim. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about the Quran and where this leads us. So they would talk about 30 rulers. We're supposed to be under one leadership. The whole point of why the Quran came to us is that so that we stay united and we have to keep united. If we start to divide, this is a sign of sectarianism, and a sectarianism is associating an idea to God that it isn't from God, and thus you are called in Arabic a mushrik. You are associating an idea to God 
which it isn't. Not believing in a day of judgment, you are put as ishraq, mushrik, because you're associating a lie and you're saying that this is how God created the world. Absolutely not. So God is saying something that is very clear in the Quran on how to deal with this situation. <clears throat> One, he said to obey God, to obey the messenger, and to obey those in authority among you. Okay, so this is clear. These leaders are authority, so we have to listen to them and obey them. Absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. Because he said authority among you. So this is somebody who's among us from the believers. So they say that, well, guys, Tabari, Maliki, Shafi'i, Bukhari, Muslim, all the Sahabas, nobody talked about rebelling or going against the leaders or, or talking about toppling over a regime or for them wanting power and all this. Well, the clear understanding is that there was nobody in the first three generations allowing usury, allowing pornography, allowing drinking, allowing casinos, allowing ties with the West and the people who are wanting to destroy Islam. They're not killing Muslims on purpose. They're not sitting there forcing their people in jails. They're not sitting there talking about the worldly life the whole time. They're not sitting there trying to promote uh, prostitution and also human trafficking. They're not starting proxy wars in Muslim lands. That was not occurring in the first three generations. So it's very difficult to find evidence on how to deal with those people in the first three generations because they didn't get to the levels that these, I don't want to swear, that these people got to. So these people are obviously not Muslim. Oh, well, you can't say that because they pray and say, La ilaha illallah. Then you're stupid for saying that. You understand that? You're defining the word kafir as something that somebody who does not believe in God. God himself called Iblis Kafir. Iblis believes in the Day of Judgment. He believes in God. And what did Iblis do? Purposefully, knowingly, did not obey God. God said to the angels, bow down. They all did, except Iblis. He was arrogant. He denied it. And he was a Kafir. He was min al kafirin. He was from the disbelievers at this point. Anyone who understands that this is a clear-cut law from God, and he goes, yeah, that's a law from God, but I'm not going to do it. That's a kafir. When when this guy, little uh, uh, Sheikh Crossfit, Rabbi uh, uh, rabbi whatever, he wants this, well, they, they, they're playing next-level chess when they're selling alcohol, and they might... Uh, they might let the sins happen around, we you know, some countries are, 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 are pushing sin around. That's clear fisk. This is clear fisk. You are detaching yourself from the commandment of God. This is clear fisk. Now, some people don't do it like they do it ignorantly. It's, it's not, they just do it ignorantly because of how life is. But if somebody goes, oh, you know what? God is, God and his messenger will fight me if I deal with interest. Okay, I'm going to deal with interest. You're a kafir. It's, it's done and done. Go pray. Go do your zakat. Do, but you are clearly 100% breaking the word of God willingly. I do not obey the hypocrites. God told the prophet, do not obey the hypocrites. That's my example. That's the sunnah. He told the prophet, do not obey the disbelievers and do not obey the hypocrites. When I'm clear, I'm seeing clear hypocrisy from me. When the guy says he's a Muslim, but all he wants is the worldly life. And he's dealing with interest and selling alcohol and selling weapons. And he wants to sit there and build palaces and play with big cars and sit there and push women to everybody. And now he wants to promote himself in a Western idea. And he wants to bring uh, Western media with all their Hollywood and all their nonsense there. This man is clearly does not care about the day of judgment. And you want me to obey him? I would be going, that would be an insult to my prophet and to God. God clearly said, do not obey them. So I would avoid you at all costs. And if I have the resource, resource to remove you, I would remove you 10 times over. I would remove you and everyone like you. But obviously we don't have the resource. So what do we do? We have our Lord. We concentrate on our life and we avoid you like sin. But I will never obey you. Even if I go to even if I go to Egypt and and the cops tell me to do something, I don't do it. I I, I try to like if he tells me to go stand there, you're in trouble, I'll go stand there. 
And then I'll wait for them. But they're so stupid, they don't realize that you're not obeying their word. They just feel like they're in power. If someone tells me to walk, I, I'm not going to walk. You're gonna, I'm not going to do it. Like, you're going to force me? Then force me and go get your sin. But I'm, God told me not to obey you. And that's what I'm going to do at this point. And now you are calling yourself a Muslim. Wait a minute. We're in 2024. We have a Zionist land that is built upon Jewish theocracy, which they don't know anything about Judaism themselves, but they label themselves as Jews, which is mentioned in the Quran. And then they want to also destroy anything to do with Islam in their country. Or they want to really modernize it so that their Islam, their version of Islam looks like the version of Judaism. It's just a label we like we it's something that we hang on our on our necklace or we put on our ID cards, but you can't do any of it because that's that's uh, extremist, you're a terrorist, you, human rights, human rights, these books are old. So this is the Islam they want to do and they want to kill everybody. God in the Quran said, the Jews and the Christians are allies to each other. Okay, and whoever allies among from you with them, is from them, is among them, is them, okay? So I've never heard of a Christian Muslim. I've never heard of a Jewish Muslim. I've never heard of a Zionist Muslim. And this is believer, because I understand the word Muslim right now is not, is not in the context that it's supposed to be. But I'm taking it from the way that people use the word Muslim. Moses was not a, a, a Jewish uh, believer. Moses was not a Christian, or Jesus was not a Christian believer. They were Muslims. They were believers, and that's it. You can be Israeli and a Muslim. You can be Israel, a child of Israel and a Christian. You could be a child of Israel and a Jew. But saying that the child of Israel is Jew, this is crazy talk. But what I'm trying to say is it's clearly that the Jewish Zionist is fighting the Muslim. Therefore, anybody who wants to ally with them, as God said, because they're fighting us, you want to align with them, align with them, you are them. So these rulers, anyone who's making ties publicly with these, I can't swear, with those people, they are Zionists. I'm not going to obey a Zionist. I am not, even if you beat me, put me in jail and tell me to shut up and kill my whole family, you're still going to be a Zionist. You can call me a Khawarij, you can call me a Rafidah, you can call me a Shia, you can call me a Quranist, you can call me deluded. You're still a Zionist. That is the absolute truth by the book of God. You could label me whatever you want to do with your propaganda. But the point is, I was told that I'm going to have one leader, one Amir, Amir al muminin I'm not supposed to have 30. Do I have to obey Bashar and Hezbollah and Sisi and uh, bin Salman <coughs> or Salman and uh, MBZ or Ishar Rafni and all these people? And none of them care about the Islam community? If they were our actual leaders... They would want to unify and be under one nation. That is how Islam works. So when you're throwing these things at us and causing sectarianism and division between the people and aligning with the enemies of Islam, how do you call yourself a Muslim leader? Oh, am I doing takfir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is technically exactly how takfir works. The Quran is full of takfir. Those who turn in the battle who were with the next to the with the prophet who turned away in battle because they were scared they are going to hell kafaru oh well that's not nice they were helping the prophet but they made a mistake that is deadly if you raise your voice over the messenger and the prophet when he's speaking you are everything that you did just went away from you there are actions that you need to really really do a lot to recover from and some actions if you don't realize them your mind changes and you want this worldly life so bad that it's very hard for you to recover because you're sealed you don't want to hear the truth anymore but let me take this a step further not only are they zionists not only are they not our rulers so they're not the authority among us but god said in the quran if you kill one person that is a believer on purpose and it's not the right to kill him he's an innocent per uh, an innocent believer or muslim and you kill him on purpose you are destined for hell one 
Okay, so if some if, if someone kills a Muslim on purpose, that person is a disbeliever. He left a religion. It doesn't matter if he prays, does zakat, whatever. If he's not going to pay for his sin and look for a proper repentance and really try hard to re repent and show how guilty and feel really bad for what he did, then at that point, this person is it's already clear on the day of judgment, other than if God wills. That is a person who is kafar. Now, let me tell you what a tahut is. Tah. Instead of killing one person, that guy would kill 20 people on purpose and still say that he's a Muslim because he's just about the lie in the show. If somebody wants to not only sell alcohol, he wants to sell alcohol, deal with drugs, and allow pornography in his country, this person is a thugger. He went way above and beyond of what he's supposed to do. He went way away from where Islam is. It doesn't matter how much of a hypocrite you are and how much you want to paint yourself. Now, God said very clearly in the Quran, those who believed and take God as the ally, he takes them from the darknesses into the light so that they could see the truth. They are with the truth and they know it's about the day of judgment and they're connected with who they love so much, their Lord. And those who want to support the who? Taghut. Those that go, the tyrants, the really bad tyrants, the Taghut will take you from light to darknesses. So everything this Taghut supporter is talking about, and by the way, this is a big no-no in the Middle East. You're not allowed to use the words that are in the Quran. I cannot use the word Taghut. That would be, put me in political jail. That would get me killed. That would get me castrated. That would get my neck brought off. I would be put as a, 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 on the news everywhere. That word is a big no-no between the security forces to say that your ru ruler is a Taghut. Taghaf al ard but this loser right here, he is the definition of a person taking you from the light to the darknesses. Why? Because he comes to you as a person who's a, I'm a scholar. The government supports me. I'm talking about religion. I will tell you the truth. And whatever your understanding of the truth, he's darkening it. He's putting you in a thing that will hurt you. Oh, yeah, just be docile. Don't protest. Don't boycott, drink your Starbucks, support your leader, even if your leader is telling you you're going to hell, that's fine, just be a good little boy. That's what Allah told us to do, that's what the Prophet told us to do. If the Prophet was alive right now, he would tell you, don't rebel against these people. It's okay for Islam to have 20, 30 leaders and they all just want to play Monopoly on a board that's not theirs. It's God's board, but they want to play Monopoly, compete with each other and compete with the West. But the West is the one holding it. Why? Because it's a Western board. They designed it how they wanted. But if you look under the board, the table that God has created itself, the table itself, which we call the world, none of what they're doing is normal. None of what they're doing is even close to what society is or what human, human life should be. So this is essentially why you should never, ever try to uh, go above and beyond to work for these entities. Anyone who's working for any government agency in the Middle East, know that you are in trouble on the Day of Judgment. You're supporting a devil no matter what. There isn't any good government in the Middle East that is not working other than for its personal interest. If Iran was able to strike a deal with Israel that was happy for Iran, and it toppled the Saudis, then they would have taken it. To them, it's a war against Saudi and it's a war for gas and, and property and businesses. You guys are just numbers. Iran is very good at forcing Shiism to Syria and to Lebanon, where those people want to stick to it. To, him, to them, in their mind, they got trained that it's jihad. But if you go to Iran, the majority of Iranians are not religious. They, they can't even control their own people, so they have to deal with the propaganda outside. Turkey is very good at the guy to, to show himself as a very devout Muslim, but yet he's the biggest mafia dealer in the world. He's the, the Turkish mafia in Turkey and in the States is very strong mafia. They are a mafia. They are not religious in any sense. They don't care about the hereafter. They, if they felt guilty, they would make the changes. They would. You cannot have an earthquake in Turkey right, where many people died by the command of God, and then the very next day you go bomb Syria where the Kurds are living. This is who they are. This is who they are. So why, what, what are you telling me I can't speak out? You want me to be quiet? Do you want me to be scared of you as you said? Oh, they have hearts of a devil, so be scared? God told me not to be scared. 
God told me to speak out. And I'm telling everybody, all my people who are watching me, speak out. Because this is what you need to do. You need to keep speaking out. And yes, some people are going to get hurt. And some people are going to face certain things if they say the right things. Where it's going to make it extremely worth it for you on the day of judgment. Trust me, I've been there. I'm banned from Egypt. I've been in political jail in Egypt. I've seen the torture in Egypt. Let me put it that way. I've been around the area and I spoke the truth. But the th I'm not trying to show off. God rescues you because you are staying on the truth. We need to remove the way, the best way we can of all of this hypocrisy that's around us. Unfortunately, we don't have the resources at this time. We don't have the proper support because they keep dividing us. So your first step is not to stand there and show big muscles and try to resort to violence and protesting and revolution. The first step, just like how I said in the first video and this video, is to unite your community in truth about God, God's book. God told us to be like this. God told us to say the truth. The Jew is an enemy. That's anti-Semitic. The Jew is an enemy. Homosexuality is wrong. Oh, that's not human right. Homosexuality is wrong. Shia and Sunni is an old political tactic. I'm, I'm over it. Aren't you over it? Well, who do you get your religion from? God. Well, do you want to still talk about it? Can we talk about it on the Day of Judgment? We have a bigger enemy. Okay, we keep bridging the community. When the community gets bridged, they have absolutely no chance other than to play game because they understand that the force now that they've been trying to subdue for the last 300 years has came back. The Muslim stopped fighting. And as soon as he stopped fighting, because he was told to stop fighting, we lost. Fight within your community. Again, not physically. Yet, inshallah, we get to a point where we can we can put our, our, our lives on the line for the religion of God so that our children have a chance. Like, look, like, you guys, look at the West. Look at America. Look at, look at Europe. They separated state from church because they no longer trusted the church. They wanted to make up their own laws and their own rules. And through trial and error, they still found the things that Islam said works. Justice, free speech, liberty, and people having the ability to do what they are allowed to do within the limits. They knew that truth works. They knew that love works. They knew that justice works. And then what did they do? They got corrupted for money. What do you think the next step is in the Muslim region? You're 600 years after Christians. You're coming to the point where the Christians separated from church and state. Now you're about to separate mosque from state. The religion is for God and the state is for the people. So now we don't use the book of God at all. And then you're going to really have some really bad children coming up. Because unfortunately, in there is verses that are clearly just about the Gulf states. That they are going to be invited to an enemy. Either they fight or either they sit again and they're losers. They chose to sit and be losers. Now they're talking bad about Palestinians for dying. How dare you die? How dare you support uh, Shiaism? They're not supporting Shiaism. Shia is the only one who's actually standing up for the oppressed, despite their political problems. This is this is where we are right now in the world. <clears throat> so I, I really hope you guys see when someone's saying to you like, "Oh, like, are you inciting violence? Listen to your r r ruler and all this stuff." Just give me one second. when they're telling you to obey your leader and all this nonsense you just say they're not my leader they're not muslims and then you show them you can show them articles how they keep breaking the verses of god over and over and over again and they're doing it willingly that's a tagut at this point it's not like there's oppressors right jabbar there is kafir but then there's tagut tagut is a definitely no no and this is what we're dealing with so uh, if anyone has any questions uh please um send me your questions hopefully i can answer them uh this is i am going to bring this to an end here right uh remember guys like my my message for this whole thing is a to expose the hypocrisy that's in the middle east so that people are not scared of talking about out we are in a day of an age now there's so many means ways to talk out that the, their, their security protocol is not as strong as people like it to be
people think that their technology is so far ahead and stuff but there's so much data now even ai like can sift so much but the ai was going to re return back hundred thousand names two hundred thousand names they don't have the resources to go get everybody right so they start to target certain individuals to make examples out of people to scare you but if everybody is talking about it what are they going to do nuke themselves like <laughs> i wouldn't put it too far when they're going to lose their chairs but that's okay we'll deal with that then uh, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen i hope uh, everybody's pleased and yeah so let me let me know if you guys have any questions before i bring this to an end inshallah uh, and I hope you guys are had a good Ramadan. I understand people want to talk about Ramadan not being Ramadan, but this is not the case. This month was Ramadan. Ramadan is coming to an end. There is very clear evidence that Ramadan is where it's at, and this is something God has commanded us in the Quran. So it's not something that He's gonna hide. Uh, he's not gonna hide Mecca. He's not gonna hide the Ramadan. He's not gonna hide the the sacred months. Those are those are things that are very clear. Well. Um, Oh, and the other thing, you know, right now, um, you might, a lot of people are asking me like, what do you, what should I do? What should I do right now? You need to be preparing. So the thing that you need to be preparing is understanding the verses of God on and how to use them to answer people. So the Quran is telling you the psychology of humans or humans and how they think and how you should think and how you should react, but it's giving you the summary points. So you're going to be put into situations where a person is acting in a certain way or he's revealing certain things and you need to remember the verses so that you know how to respond. People nowadays, for some weird reason, responding with the verse of the Quran point blank, it doesn't change people. So what you need to do is kind of express to them what the verse said, right? Without... Um, without actually saying the verse, because as soon as they find that it's Qur'an, they, they go back to deaf, dumb, and blind. So for me, it's a very, uh, very, very, uh, I find it a very beneficial approach, is that when I am put in a situation, I say the verse either just like in an English term or in a way where it is saying what the verse is without having the need to say it. And if somebody is a Sunni and Shia, because I would say what I said, and if he argues, I'm like, man, I just literally told you what the Quran says, and you're arguing, and then I will say the verse. And then you'll see the guy feel like a, an idiot, right? So it's like someone goes to me, it's like, oh, well, how do you know that the Quran that you have right now is the one from God if you don't take hadith? Uh, okay, well, because I believe in the context, like the context makes sense that it's from God. And I believe it, 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 it's like, it's from God. And then he goes, well, prove it, prove it. Like, you can't say that. Like, he'll, he'll give me a dumb excuse. And I'll show him, like, chapter 3, verse 7. Literally says, we believe in it. It's all from God. Those are the people who have knowledge. You don't have knowledge? You don't think it's from God? You need somebody to tell you that it's from God? And you're obviously not a Muslim. Or not, you don't say you're not a Muslim, but you're obviously not a person who believes or takes refuge in the book. And at that point, you've captured him. So when you express to them what you understood from the verse, and then you show them the verse, they usually have a system crash, and that's when they either insult you, they turn away, or they leave. And uh, it's it's pretty, um, it's it, it works very well. I would love to have some view of yours on jinn, exorcism, kohfi kaf, and umm al qura. Kohi kaf. I don't I, I don't understand what the third one is. Umm al qura is is Mecca and what's around it. Umm al qura is the area you could say from the Holy Land to Mecca and what is around it. That's Umm al qura would be Mecca, so, right? And and everything around it is the qura, which is the cities. So this is what Umm al qura is. Jinn is very real, obviously, and exorcisms are also very real, because there are people that they take refuge or they seek help from the jinn, and the jinn tires them. So I'm not gonna get into certain things with jinn. Me being someone who was being set up to get close to Hollywood at a certain time in my life, I understand how they use gin and how the gin works. Like, imagine having a conversation with a stranger that you don't know. You're having a conversation with a stranger, and you're having a conversation about a situation that you're going with. And this stranger is talking to you, not like, it's not direct, it's all like subliminal messaging. So you're talking to each other subliminally about your situation, and... You don't know how this stranger knows it, but it doesn't feel like you're talking to this actual human that's in front of you. It's, it's as if you're talking to like he's on a radio and you're talking to somebody else. Okay, that's not the weird part. 
So you, you, after you finish the conversation or you get upset from him, so you're on a bus, you talk to, to this individual, he's hinting at a problem that you're doing that they don't like. And then you get off the bus and you say, man, just leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you. And you go out and you start walking on the street and a different random individual starts walking next to you. And he goes, well, we didn't finish our conversation. Why are you walking away from me? Okay. And it's like, it's because these individuals are controlled literally by Jin they understand it. And they're doing what they're told with the voice that's inside their head. This is something that's very known in Hollywood. They try to keep it hush-hush because that's the secret. That's what they call the secret. They have a voice in their head. Some of them think it's Jesus. Some of them think it's the devil, which it is the devil. And people are deluded in different ways. And what the jinn does is they try to keep you exhausted and they try to not let you mention God. So they don't, for them, it's painful when you mention God because of certain understandings and certain ideas that I don't want to get into it because it is literally what brainwashing and, and, and magic is. It's a form of dirty magic. But the Quran, it dispels a lot of what they say and, and it doesn't, it still hurts you, but it doesn't affect you because you know the truth while they don't know the truth. They're hiding the truth. So jinn is something that's very real. Okay, now what's your advice on finding a believing woman? Seems nigh impossible at this point. Okay, so about that question, a believing woman, if you mean someone that's a Quran alone woman, they, they exist, right? But uh, you, like, there's way, it, it's difficult where you are in the world. If you, I mean, I don't know, God knows, but it's easier if you're able to travel and you have a way to produce money that you can find a believing woman. But the other thing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you taking a Sunni or a Shia or a Christian that doesn't believe that Jesus is God or a Jew, because those are those those are allowed for you, right? And you have to understand it's all about tolerance, right? You stick to your rules, your God is first, and you're not here to serve the girl, you're here to help her and to live with her. But you're serving your God. And the reason why you want a girlfriend is or sorry, a wife, I, I I interchange the terms. I'm not saying in a negative way. But the reason why you want a wife or a husband is so that you get an opportunity to build for your hereafter. For me, I am my sister. I'm not going to get into too much detail. I, I find she's a very, very well productive and amazing individual who's, who, is, who loves the religion a lot. And for her, it's easier to even worship God than to have, to be in a, in, have a husband in front of her 24-7. But still, she understands why it's nice to be in polygamy and these reasons that the Qur'an produces. Because it's, to her, it's about the hereafter. It's not about now. So if you're looking for someone who's, who's just, okay, when you're, if you're looking for Qur'an alone, it's, it's, it's going to, you have to put your trust in God. You have to keep asking God to show you. And don't, if they're a true believer, then it's about their faith rather than, I'm not saying that this is who you are. Superficial reasons like their looks or certain things or whatever. But yeah, you should be able, to, you should uh, have the ability to travel because it's very difficult to find it within your community. I uh, personally, I've seen people that talk to girls on certain apps like uh, that are geared towards Sunnis and Shias, more so Sunnis. And they kept telling them their methodology and telling them why they're Quran alone until a girl goes, you know what, that kind of makes sense. I like that. And then they started a relationship that way. Uh, it's forbidden to make sahar. Yes, sahar is definitely forbidden. Uh, yeah, someone that follows the God alone. I've seen that. Uh, it's been a big shock, but now everything makes sense. Alhamdulillah. There's mu'min women, yes, uh, more than you know. But sometimes you have to open their eyes first. Yes, I see where you're coming from. Alhamdulillah. Also, some of your shorts are so funny. Some Sunnis are circling past and laughter. I know, I know. Um, uh, not all jinns are bad. The good jinns, you will not sense them. You will not hear them. They will not interact with you in that sense. It's just so that they don't tire you. Anyone who's dealing with a jinn, the jinn will tire you. As God said, they will cause you more ex exhaustion. I'm not gonna get into details because it's not a it's not an easy path. It's a difficult path, and you you will end up with very exhausted at times. And the problem is that the devil, the devil jinn, wants to exhaust you so that you get depressed, 
and you, you what they say is you turn away from the mercy of God that this is such a terrible life this sucks this is so much pain I'm in trouble I, I don't know. You, if you do that the devil keeps taking a hold of you you still get negative thoughts you're not in a heavenly mode you're not very uh, you're not bathing in God's mercy and God's mercy is always close there are individuals where they understand what's on stake so they employ jinn and they know that they're going to tire them I'm not saying that that's what I did or what other like people around me do, but it, it is there is a path where God says because those that believe in God they're not they're not worried about uh, being tired or or uh, being fatigued, right? So and in history even Solomon had jinn under him and and the jinn are always trying to put their thought in your head and they keep trying to repeat their thoughts so that they're thinking on your behalf. Jinn cannot always interact with the physical world except if god allows them now an angel can interact with the physical world obviously we don't see angels but the angels can make something happen in the physical world by the permission of god jinn want to be able to but they cannot because they're not on the truth so they won't, they usually try to take over your mentality and your sense so they are with you as god said you're you're partners in the pain because you were partners in the world so whenever you're getting drunk, he's kind of getting drunk with you. Whenever you're feeling certain things, he's feeling them with you. Sometimes he gets angry, so you get angry. So there's a there's there's a pattern, there's a there's a connection when you start to employ jinn. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of people under jinn influences because there's some major big jinns aside from iblis that they they have it's a mentality, it's a system, so it's a thought. And if like take communism, communism came from technically a devil, a jinn. It presented itself to a certain individual and this individual spread this idea and as long as this idea is alive that jinn and that community is still striving as thoughts because this is what jinn is jinn is giving you thoughts when somebody believes in god and says god is my lord god brings the angels down upon that person and the angels say that we are your friends in the life and the hereafter uh, and look forward to the heaven because that's what god has promised so you start getting angelic thoughts they're not from you, but they feel like they're from you. So you'd be walking down the street and you see a hungry person and you in your mind, you say to yourself, maybe I should feed him. That could be an angel helping you to increase your worldly life. Jinn and angels work very similarly, but angels can manipulate the worldly life. So this is all I'm going to talk about jinn. But yeah, I have a, I have a, a lot more about jinn and all this stuff. As I said, uh, I know how the West and certain Gulf regions use the jinn and the symbology of jinn and how jinn thinks so please even if you have take time please do an app on al ghaib al ghaib is unseen they come from what do you think of music music is legal music is fine music is like a book music is like a, a, a piece of art right so it's the intention behind the music is what is the problem so if your intention is to cause corruption with your music or your intention is to worship something other than God with your music or if your music is about you making money or you're being a poet saying what you're not doing, then your the content of your music is not right. It's against God. So you're not working for God at this point. It's not worship. You're worshiping other than God in that moment. But if your music is to glorify God, then your music is legal. Imagine if someone says to you, well, because they use music, uh, in devilish activities and a lot of devils use devil uh, music as 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 an influence over people and they ban music then we should also ban writing we should add, uh, ban books because there's a lot of books that are teaching you how to be a devil so should we is that how we approach life now and, and birds sing the ocean has its music everything has its rhythm and natural rhythm where we are looking for that melod melodic rhythm and the quran itself the Quran itself, they, the people who are the top reciters, the people who are, you're hearing them recite a lot, they use something called, uh, in Arabic, maqamat. Maqamat are musical modes, I think, in English. And there's about seven of them that they get branched. And literally, the acronym to remember these seven things is sunyafi sihrika, which is, it's created in your magic. Because music has the ability to 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 let you put your skepticism aside for a little bit and to follow your emotions so you become emotional and emotions usually make you feel empathetic so whatever you're presented with you start to relate with because emotions is something that is 
very key to a human, especially on the day of judgment. God is always expressing people's emotions on the day of judgment. And people are, God is talking about the people who have a hard heart. Their heart has been hardened. Therefore, they do not feel emotions. So music has the ability to manipulate your emotions, and they do that with the Quran. So one of these seven maqamats is one of them is for sadness. So the way that, that like so that, like that is a musical mode, right? So Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm Al-Din Iyaka Na'budu Wa Iyaka Nasta'in that, that is me using musical theory in recitation. But it's not musical theory because, yes, it applies to music, but it's melodies. In anything, you can put a melody. So, of, of course, music is not haram. No music, but Fifty Shades of Grey is a must read. <laughs> Thank you. So now, uh, you should collaborate with Quranic Islam. Uh, I, my brother, uh, I don't know if... I. I don't know if I'm allowed to say his name. But yeah, my brother from Quranic Islam, he's a very well person. And if you really guys want to know where the good sheikhs are, they're in Saudi jails. Uh, yeah, so that's all I'm going to say about that topic. But yeah, Quranic Islam is an excellent individual. He, uh, me and him, we talked a few times. I went on his channel a few times. Uh, he is from the people which they relate to themselves or rely, uh, call themselves Quranic centric. Quran -cent Quranic centric? centric what was it uh quran centric muslims so they still take from tradition as per what they would say narrations from the prophet and then they would filter it through the quran which is fine but at that point you're still not taking a religious authority because i'm pretty sure if i ask him do you uh do you stone anybody he's gonna say no salam brother how are you Rashid Mishari is a good example of what you say music exactly and you could you could put like uh, you could put for example the other guy uh, you have a few of them like Dorsi I think he is and Raad if you put like Fatiha seven modes you will see them reciting in seven different ways and each one of them is sticking to a certain melodic mode so that they could use the emotions of the human as well in my opinion fiat is worse than bitcoin do you agree no no definitely not bitcoin is much worse than fiat they're both fiat currencies, but Bitcoin's a speculative asset. There's a difference between a speculative asset and a fiat currency. The fiat currency can be traded at its value based upon of what is available, right? And however much is being printed is going to be, to be reflective of the price of that entity. If right now somebody mines a thousand Bitcoins, the price of Bitcoin would not change. Because right now it's still, it, yes, he would have all those Bitcoins, but the price of Bitcoin would not change instantly. So this is why it's A, speculative, and B, it being speculative asset, it's based on interest. So imagine a box, like your farm, this is for the people who are mining, not for the people who are uh, just trading, but the miners, the, the actual currency itself. Imagine you have a farm, you sleep and you wake up, and now your farm is 1.1% bigger. So it's like 101% bigger. How did your farm increase in size? Uh, just because I left the computer running. Okay, that makes no sense. But that's literally what's happening. Because there is no, there is nothing coming in and out as a substance. You are transferring electrons. I'm talking about reality. I'm not talking about how what we're saying is and what it isn't. But the electrons get put in a computer and the electrons will leave the computer and that's it. So the electricity is run. There is no value being, there is no actual asset being changed. The paper money is actual paper. So you, you eventually can run out of paper. But you could recycle that electricity in the same box and say, I'm still making money. So this is why it's a disaster. It eventually, eventually, I understand the whole concept of halving. I understand the whole concept of the different stake or not like uh, the different uh, proof of method. Let's say on how they they make their database. But at the end of the day, you're you're just a a box with electricity. That's not anything of value. Now I can attach my fiat currency as it was supposed to be as a banknote to go back to gold. You technically cannot do that with Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin, the thing that is backing it is the electrical grid. 
So if my oil prices drop, technically my Bitcoin has to drop, but it doesn't. So it's not attached to anything. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's a very sad thing, just so you know. Some people went against music, but I thought the same as long as the music doesn't tell you to do stuff. That's exactly it, right? So if my I have music on my channel. I don't know if you guys uh, heard my uh, uh, music, but yeah, my music is is dedicated to. I'm thinking about God when I'm right. I'm just like uh, right now. I'm thinking about God. Alhamdulillah. There's there's a way to. Let me put it this way: If you are sitting in a house, right, and you believe that there's somebody over the roof. Now, sense that you can't see the person that's on your roof, but sense the person in that roof. Okay, now, like, but let's just put an imaginary friend or your best friend is sitting on the roof, right? And you know where he's sitting on the roof, so you could think about him. And now you, 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 now that I remember my friends on the roof, I can sense him. You, you know that feeling, you can sense him. Now, put it as a bigger example. Above the sky or in the sky and everywhere around you is God. So you can literally in your mind connect with it. And that connection, you if you keep practicing it, you can even get it in your dream. So when a situation come up, you just make that connection back and you're like, oh wow, yeah, you know, my Lord's here. I shouldn't be doing this. This is the true, what I understood as what taqwa is consciousness. I am picturing, not I can't see him, but I am remembering my Lord who is behind the sky that I cannot see beyond the sky, but it, the entity is there. And yeah, it's like feeling a ghost almost. But of course, God has a bigger example. I'm just trying to, uh, where can we hear your music? You guys want to hear my music? I'll put, I'll put one song. I'll put one song. Let me think, which song would I put? It's on my YouTube. I'll uh, Let me pull up the song and then we can hear it together. Uh, my channel, da, 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 videos. Let me see, which one should I put? I'm going to put the one that I like a lot. Um, but alhamdulillah, again, I, I did this for God. Uh, I was, I, yeah, I'm not going to get into the history of my music, but let me see. It's this one. One second. All right. Ready? Here we go. Mystical decibel, warning you of an undetectable spectacle and the most dependable manifesting the physical and undeniable lyrical signal. But your typical response is of a cynical mental of a radical individual at the pinnacle of criminal. A classical piece of doubt despite the empirical, logical evidence of the infallible. Picture an insatiable taste of an attainable capital by an emotional, destructible, corruptible imbecile. A whimsical, pitiable animal versus an indivisible biblical figure with principles. A morale of the best rationale available. Up against the delusional, despicable cannibal. And now you could call me allegorical. But tell me which side of this example's for you relatable. Of the resurrectable is resultable in a beautiful, unlivable mind. Unstable, emotionally unavailable. Wanna shut me up? Better step back, you need a rewind. Your diabolical, habitual, daily ritual of a pessimistic, negative outlook is breakable. Conditional, just like your choice of an instrumental or relational based on a fixation to God. Heaven starts inside with the peace of the mind. Another man telling you you're working wrong, but you wanna keep pushing along with your dark thoughts. Thoughts that are not compatible with the God. Now a theistical response from intelligence is to put this digital deliverable to the test. Here's the evidence for what the meaning of the existence is. It's self-control. Now just listen and do what you're told. I will. Not a 
up until my last breath. Come on. I've got to climb. No rest right now. That's uh, the latest song that I did. I'm not right now. I just don't have time for music. I love music. Music's awesome, but uh, awesome. I appreciate it. Uh, you guys have any questions? Good music, Arthur. Yet you can't tell me what God can be or not be. Uh, okay, so one one thing that people I might help you with is that the reason why Abraham and the mentality of Abraham dominated because he was able to find an idea of who god is where god is totally dominant so if you go to what the greeks and the romans were doing with polytheism the god the idea of their definition of what god is was very weak it was something that where god is not dominant so you in your mind the more you can glorify and you can expand on what an idea of a god is the closer you are to the truth. But God is also giving you the attributes on where he would be on the scale. So these are what we would call the Asma al-Husna, the, the good names of God or the good attributes of God. So technically for God to be God, he would be able to be the biggest entity available, which would be positive infinity. And then he should also be the smallest entity available, which would be negative infinity. And he is obviously in between all of them. But where would God be in that scale? He would be in negative plus because bigger is better than small. Now, God is also causing all the pain in the world, but God is also causing all the pleasure and good feelings in the world. So this is all God's, uh, like the, the feelings you get, these are all power from God. But where does God, res like where would you find God uh, God's collective, it would be in the good feeling because God is a good God. He's not a negative God. So anybody who wants to go against where God's default position is, he is no longer in the collective of God and he's acting in a singular or a collective of other devils because you're rebelling from God, you're a devil. So trying to find the collective of w uh, on which side God would be on an equation, that is where you stay in the grace of God. So God is, as God said in the Quran, he is the people, God is the people of mercy uh, and uh, the people of taqwa, awareness. God is aware of all things. So you, as a person who is a believer, you'll start to become aware of your surroundings more. It's because you're always constantly trying to stay aware and reminding yourself of God. So every time you're sitting and pondering about God, you have to try to exemplify Him and always give everything back to Him. Everything has to go back to Him. You unify Him and you exemplify him, and you also have to find the opposite of what you found, and God would be on whatever is more dominant, which is very clear all the time. That is why everything is created in pairs. That's why the truth is very clear, and that's why everything has been created in truth. So, Alhamdulillah Rabbil All right, any other questions, guys? Say Allah instead of God. God is not Allah. No, uh, okay. So, linguistically, Allah. That's what you're saying. Al, Al, Allah. So the name is La. Al is a uh, ta'rif or the. So Al Rahman. Al Al Rahman, uh, the merciful. Al Samia. Sorry, guys. I think my battery is about to run out. Anyways. So uh, Al Hadi, uh, Al Qadir, the, the able. Al Hay, the living. So you notice how it always starts with Al. Al is the. Okay, the, the definite article. So the name itself, the name itself is after the definite article, just like how we say Lillah to God. We don't put Li Allah, right? Lillah. We drop the Alif. So the name is La. La is God. There are no deities, La ilaha illallah. There are no deities except the God. 
Because in English, the word Allah is the God. If I go to somebody in English and I say to him, I am a Muslim and I believe in uh, Allah, the English speaker is going to go, I understood nothing. But if I go to an English speaker and I say, I'm a submitter and I believe in the God, the English speaker is going to be like, okay, that makes sense. And that's translatable in all languages. So I believe in Romanian's domnezeo, right? Uh, in Russian, it's bog. In in Spanish, it's Dios. In Arabic, it's Allah. In English, it's God. This is what people understand as the definition of what God is. So we we stick. It's easier. It's uh, how would you translate Rab? Rab is Lord. Rab is Lord. Say Allah instead of God. God is not Allah. Allah is God. How do you translate Rab? Uh, Lord, any other questions, guys? I, I am I understand that my camera is about to die soon. So, what is your Quranic take, uh, Quran Islam's take on 434? What is you, Roxanne? Are you still here for me? I'll answer that question for you. It's not a problem. All right, I like these streams, guys. I uh, I do have a few more topics I want to discuss, and then we're going to move on to a few other things. It's still going to be the state of community, but I want to focus on hypocrisy for a little bit. And hopefully next we're going to start maybe finding some tactics and finding some procedures to try to make the world a better place. Us as humans, we're responsible to make this world a better place, and people just don't want to make the world a better place. Email, please, if you can. You guys have uh, my email. My email's on the under the about section on my channel. Uh, I don't ask for donations. I don't want donations. Uh, thank God, alhamdulillah, I'm well provided for. Uh, if you guys want to donate, donate to a good cause. Right now, UNRWA, which is getting its funding cut from all the countries because they're actually active in Palestine, that's a good organization to to send to. There's also another one called the Abrahamic Foundation, Abraham's Foundation, which is a Quran alone foundation that uh, works in uh, parts of Africa. It works in uh, in Pakistan and in other regions where they need a lot of help. And, and they do that. Will you make a video on how to pray without hadith? Uh, I talked in the last episode in regards to prayer. There isn't there isn't a set way to pray. You get up and pray. If you want to pray like the Sunnis pray, then pray like the Sunnis pray. But fix what you're saying and don't say the concepts of shirk that they say. You just have to recognize what you're saying. If you want to stand up and you start your prayer and you start reciting your Quran and then you go right to prostration and sujood, as long as you're covering the time and doing what you need to do, which with what God said is part of a prayer, then it's acceptable. There is no set procedure for prayer. God gave you a set procedure for wudu, uh, for ablution in the Quran, because there's a set procedure. But He didn't give a set procedure for prayer other than what He would like as in, uh, as concepts that are in your prayer, which not like what He wants, because it's best for you. So there's things of prostration. There's standing and reciting the Quran. There is glorifying your Lord. There is uh, the concept of tasbih. There's concepts of giving gratitude. There's concepts of uh, alhamd. And you have the examples of what other people said. So even if you look at Sunnis, they're not they're not all on the same page when it comes down to prayer. Shias are definitely not on the same page as Sunnis and as with themselves with the prayers. So they're all they all have their little different styles. Again, you can pray like the Sunnis. Just be careful of what they say. I'm not a Quranist. A Quranist is an insult uh, to us. Because we f believe in God's book, I'm a believer. But yes, I do. I do not take uh, hadith as religious authority. I do read hadith. Uh, I put the hadith from the scope of the Quran, just so that I understand what my, uh, what I would consider my like. Sorry, I'm not gonna swear. My my brothers, my brothers are saying whether it's from the Shias or Sunnis. Um, so I, I have to understand why they say what they say, and and, and unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, their hadith books, the ones that they wrote, they contradict themselves. So it's a good way to to have a discussion with them and show them their error. If they, if as uh, as God said with when Solomon was trying to guide when Solomon was trying to guide Queen Sheba, she was worshiping the sun. And when she realized that the sun deceived her, 
like she thought she's looking at water, but it was just a reflection. And it was the reflection of the sun off the marble. It made her think that it was water. She realized the sun deceived her and God to her would not deceive. And she realized that the God of Solomon is right and her God is wrong. So if I can show them that the, the Hadith is deceiving them, then they might see that God would not deceive them, but these books are deceiving them, and therefore they might submit back to the book that united everyone. How do Hadith rejectors pray? I just answered that. But I'm follower of Salaf. Okay, cool. Nice. Okay, so what happened with the fourth generation? Dragons overboard. Can can you tell me what like what happened? Like the so we had three righteous guided guided right righteous guided setup for three generations and like the fourth generation is just became fuck boys like they just stopped caring about religion or is that when hypocrites started why is the hypocrites show up and the liars show up after you wrote down whatever they wrote down like why what, what happened with the fourth generation why is it only the first three like i think that's a very important question why not two why the third one as well it's, it's very funny do you believe the world is designed to go downhill until the day of Qiyamah? No, the world is actually designed to go uphill, but the human is default state. The human once goes downhill because of the influence that we're under. So we are under uh, the influences around us that is the devil that's trying to make us to buy into the world. So buying into the world means that we're going to have to become arrogant. We're going to have to not really care about each other. It's about what we have and we don't want to lose what we have. That's how the human has been designed. The human is designed for everlasting life in heaven where what we have will never get lost. The feeling of losing something is terrible. So those that buy into the world, the worst thing that they have is uh, losing something that burns them. So the world is not designed to go downhill, I believe. The world is designed to a, get to a point where it's destroyed. But if people are righteous, as God said, that God would not punish a civilization that is righteous. God will provide and increase if people are righteous. If people are worried about that everyone needs to get fed, that people need to have housing, that people need to have water, that people need to have ways to, 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 to produce, to fight the evil instincts, to fight the evil ideas, and humanity works as a single core unit like ants and, and, and bees, then God will keep increasing us. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. The good sheikhs are in Saudi jails. Yeah, that's very true. That is very true. Salam, would you say... Al is haram, AI, AI is haram, AI is not haram, I see it as money, it can be used both, for, yeah exactly, AI is not haram, AI, artificial intelligence is produced by the knowledge that God has given us, AI can be used for a lot of haram things, but the thing is, no matter what, what computer program they're going to design, where they're going to release on the world after its, after its initial training, when they get to a level of artificial intelligence where it can train itself, it will have to pass the Qur'an. Remember that. It will have to pass the Qur'an. So we are always safe by God. God is not going to oppress us unless if we're oppressing ourselves. If the AI is released to see the internet, then it's going to copy and understand what the people on the internet were doing. So if we were corruptors in the land, the AI is going to be a corruptor. If we were good people and the internet was full of positive material, then that's what the AI will learn. This is how it works. That's the simple truth. The worst thing that they could do is release the AI over Twitter, for example. It would become disgusting very quickly. I find people make the religion complicated and confused. Exactly. What does a new Muslim do when they're getting so many different opinions on what path to take? You rely on God. And you go back to what the Quran is saying. You don't, God gave you the intellect and God gave you the book. You go understand it. If you are having a first where you're struggling with, you go just ask for a single opinion and see where you were in your mind about what you're understanding. You're not going to understand every verse. Me, I've been reading this book for many years, decade. There's still verses where I do have an interpretation. But I understand that it's my interpretation and it, it might be, but I'm not fully grasping of what's being said because I don't feel myself being in that situation, one. And two, it's not a verse for myself. So I don't worry. But the clear-cut verse is that everyone's going to understand those. So just remember, there, there are some things that are, uh, do you agree on putting lana on? I don't know them. Why would I do that? 
So there's some verses where you're going to understand them differently than everybody else because you have a mission in the world. God, when he brought the verse down, he knew how you would understand it. That's how God guides you. God guides you because of the environment that you're around, because of what you've been through, because of what you've seen. If you go back to your history, then you can find your destiny. If you're a person who's inclined to helping others and you like the concept of surgery, then it's clear that God is saying that one of the roles for you is you, you could be a good doctor and a good believer. So some verses you will understand differently from the rest of the world. And this is what's the beauty about the Quran. The Quran, despite it being such an amazing book, to everybody it's a fingerprint. It's very unique to your understanding. There's things that we don't need to reinterpret when it's, for example, God is saying that spend from what you have been given. There's no need to interpret that. That's a very clear cut. But if God is saying that, for example, um, let me put it this way. Yeah, the one that I was talking about earlier about the jinn, like some people or, or you know what? Like, uh, let's take the example of the man that walked next to Moses. The man next to Moses, to everybody, he looked like a criminal. Yeah, he was a guided person. He's not a criminal. He's a person who was working for God. So Moses even thought that this man was out of his mind. So some people need to understand that the world, you have a position. You have a fate. You have something that you need to do. And, if, and the person who actually came the closest to his destiny and to fulfill his role was Abraham. So if... He didn't waste time. He knew what he wanted to do and he did it in the name of his Lord because he knew his Lord told him to do it. <clears throat> Everybody has that. So God gave you a set amount of time and he knows how much you're going to accomplish in this set of time. If you take a whole year break, then you're one year away from where you could have been when you died. If you take a 10 years break, then you're 10 years away from where you're supposed to be when you die. So the people who really love God, they work. They work a lot. Because God said that he created life and death to test you as the best worker. So the Quran is there to support you in what you want to present to the world in the name of God. So me feeding people, God is feeding them through me. But I want to come up with a system so that I'm feeding a lot of people. For me personally, I just don't like that uh, there's a lot of corruption. So I'm making it, I'm waging a war in my mind on how I can defeat this hypocrisy that destroyed all my countries, all my people, all my civilization. I, I don't, I'm, it makes me emotional sometimes, but it's, uh, it's, it, we need to do something because I've seen a lot of people, the hurt they went through and how they forced them in a very weird way to become mushriks. And I don't want to get into those details, maybe a little later, but um, no one can corrupt God, exactly. You cannot corrupt the truth. The truth is the truth. People want to play around with the truth, but the truth does not change. So that's why I say when someone calls me a kharij or an anti-Semite, those are not truth. But if I say that uh, Zionism is anti-God, that's truth. If I say that our leaders are hypocrites, that's truth. I'm not insulting. I'm saying what God has said from the book. If they don't like it, they take it up with God. But God didn't call anyone a kharij. So that's, that's going to be difficult for them to explain. Tell me about Al Insan 76. Like the verse 76? Because I think Insan itself is 76, no? Uh, let me see. I think Insan itself is, a, is, uh, is 76. I might be wrong. I don't have the uh, surahs memorized by, uh, by their numbers. 70, Insan. Yeah, it is 76. So which ayah you want to know? It's That one's, that one's pretty clear. Seems to me that you uh, seems to me like all of you have perfect loving family. Whatever person does, look, my parents and me, we did we went through a lot, but it was the Quran that made me realize that uh, despite on who my family is and who they are, uh, if you look at it in a positive light, you can always know how to deal with them. My father, he was somebody who was extremely supportive in his way, but maybe he was not the way I wanted him to be. But, and we, me and my father, we went at a, a lot of like ways at each other. And my father has no problem with cutting somebody out of his life. But my father is also very good that if someone approaches him and shows that, you know what, like I was incorrect here, 
he will still support you. You know, if I if I'm in trouble and I I'm sleeping on the street, he would let me sleep on the street for a whole week if he has to, just to punish me. But then when when I need to get picked up, he'll pick me up. You understand me? My father was not very easy to deal with because he had his way of preserving his family. Now a lot of people they don't come from a loving parent household because of what we're being sold on the internet. Not only us. The people before us, the generations before us, which is our our parents, they were going through the communist and they were going through the Cold War era. So for them, emotions and showing emotions is not something that's acceptable in that modern time because that was revealing who you are. So it was all about secrecy and it was all about being someone that everyone's out to get you in espionage. This is what they were under. Whether it's your own government or your external governments or someone's always trying to subvert you. So expressing yourself was not something that they were allowed to do because that's how they were taught. Okay, They were all about, uh, that was what they were going through as, a, as children. So when they grow up, they're, gonna, they're not going to be very emotionally attached until the internet came around and, and started to show them pictures of cat and, and dogs. They, might, they started to relax a little bit. So you might have grown up in an environment where your parents seem like they're not very loving and perfect, right? But you are the one who can change that by just tolerating and knowing that they're not going to change. But the more you show them love, the more they're going to realize that they have a good person in their, in their house, um, a good son. And if you can't, then the best thing to do is just to separate, but keep in touch. Keep in touch. Even if you argue, even if you fight for a little bit, Go away for a few days and then just keep in touch. Keeping in touch with them, you'll see when you're older and when they're older, things things are a little different because they need your help when you're older. Just put it that way. They, they can't hurt you. They can't abuse you when they're older to a certain level. Obviously, they can hurt you with their words, but they, they can't really control you when you're older, but they're going to need help when you're older. And, and whatever good you do for them, God knows it. That's the amazing part. Like Even if they're hurting you, even if they're crossing you, saying stupid stuff to you, you... You rely back to God, and God is watching you, and God told you to be kind to your parents. Okay, so now, oh, 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 what? Uh, El Insan uh, 31. Yeah, do you want all 31 aliens? You want me to talk to you about the whole chapter of El Insan? Uh, that one's pretty clear, brother. But you know what? I'll, I'll just run it through it. Uh, let me see. After marriage, I believe. No, Jin was it insane after it? Jin, do do do. Sorry, give me a second. Insane, there it is. Uh, do do do. Insane. Yeah, you want all thirty-one, I guess. Um. Bro, just admit you're a Sunni pretending to be a Hadith rejector. No, I'm not a Sunni. I promise you, I'm not a Sunni. I don't want to be a Sunni, and I will never be a Sunni. That is incorrect. If I could remove all the books of Hadith from the Haram and the Aqsa, I would do that today. I would not allow a single Hadith to be read in the Haram if it was up to me. I would remove half of what they're doing if I was running the show. So, yeah, so um, the humans didn't exist before, right? So maybe they should realize that they don't know it all. Uh, we created, a, like the human came from a little tiny sperm, a little tiny thing, and now you're this big, right? So it's like, that is how God is showing you how we cre creation. Like, he, from something very tiny, you produced. But now you're thinking King Kong, but you came from a little tiny thing. And now you're tested because now you can see and you're here. So now you are aware of your seeing, you're aware of your hearing. So that's something that you're going to be tested and you're asked about. Uh, so some people, when they're guided, they're grateful. When they get things, they feel good inside. They're thankful inside. Those people are God is saying Shakura. And the person opposite of that, he's calling Kafura. 
So the disbelievers they don't like what they're getting. Oh, oh, this is not good enough. The food is too too hot. Oh, I don't like the car that I have. I should have a better car. Well, yeah, no, I got a new car, but you know what? Maybe the chairs should have been brown. This phone is okay. I just wish I got the newer model. Oh man, my mom is always late to pick me up. There's no thankfulness in them. Like me, sometimes, honestly, when I get a bottle of water in certain situations, I sit and cry and thanking God just because like it was in a situation where it was it was amazing. So thankfulness is something, thankfulness is a feeling. It's not saying thank you, yes, thank you, you say it, but it's a gratefulness theory, feeling. So this is how you're being tested. Lel kafirin, God has put them hell. Why? Because they have hellish thoughts. They're building their hell. They get presented to God. God tests them. They're going to show who they are, and they're just going to burn for who they are. Okay, that's very easy. Uh, the people who are uh, abrar, the ones who... Uh, does Quran have preference between monogamy or polygamy for humankind? They're both valid. They both have their equal places. And it's based on the individual, not on the actual humankind as a whole. So there's people where God has favored them so that they would be able to be uh, polygamous. And there's people where he showed them different favor where they're able to be monogamous. And it's different for, they both have their roles in society. Now, Adam was monogamous, just so we know that. No, we don't have our own hadith. But so to carry on, we the they're going to hell. The other people are going to be drinking from uh, a nice uh, a nice a nice drink that it's going to taste like a kafir. I believe it's uh, it's like a a herb that we have here on Earth. It's actually you can find it closer to Japan if I'm not wrong. Ainan yashabu biha ibadullah. So the servants of God, uh, uh, they drink from it. They are the ones who are completing what they're being told, and they're high, they're scared. The servants of God. This is the servants of God. They are scared of the day of judgment. They are fulfilling their like warnings and what they need to do. And this is how they're servants of God. They're feeding the people because they love the fact that people are being fed. It doesn't. Uh, people who are poor, people who are orphans, and people who are in jail or or in trouble, like uh, in stranded, you could say. Uh, and they're saying to them, we're not feeding you, we're feeding you for the face of God, like God is feeding you, not me. Um, we are scared of what God is preparing on the day of judgment. Uh, it's a very tough day. So God has saved them from the evil of that day. And he met them with glee. Uh, and he rewarded them uh, because of their steadfastness and their patience with uh, a garden and silk. And then God is explaining to them what they get in heaven, which is amazing things. And then he tells the prophet that we brought down to you the Quran. This is um uh, this is at 23 at this point. Yeah, and we gave you the Quran. We're the ones who brought you the Quran. So you should be patient with God and do not obey the sinners and do not obey the ingratitude, ingratitude, uh, ingratitude, the people with ingratitude or the disbelievers. So he's telling the prophet to do it. I'm following the prophet. I'm following, as you guys call it, the sin. I'm following the sin of the prophet, which I'm finding right here. Don't believe the disbelievers or don't obey the disbelievers and uh, people who are committing sins. That's the Arab leaders. So they go back to what we're talking about. With course, so say, like, you know, uh, keep reminding yourself or remember the name of your God morning and night and at night um prostrate to him and exalt him a long night the people want the worldly life uh, and if god wanted he could have removed them right now and he would have it could have changed them uh or yeah he could have changed them god has brought down a reminder for whoever wills he can take a way of god and you cannot will except what God has willed. Therefore, God has gave, given you the ingredients for you to be guided. You cannot do other things and say that this is how I'm getting guided. God told you the parameters of guidance. If you don't do those parameters, then you can't you can't get it. Okay. Uh, God is very wise, and this is why he put these parameters, because it helps us be better humans. He puts whoever he wants in his mercy, which is in the world and the hereafter. And for the oppressors or the people who darken, they he set for them a very painful punishment. So that's insane. Uh, I hope I answered the question. Bro is hunting Sunnis and Shia. Bro hunting Sunnis and Shia, not Shias. Hunting Sunnis and not Shias. What? 
Bro, Shias are in a much worse position than Sunnis theologically. What, like, why would I go to someone who is in a deeper level of problems than someone who is closer to the truth? If I topple the person who's like who's closer to the truth, I toppled both of them. But if you want to talk about Shias, Shias actually, despite them having more problems with theology, they actually stick more to what they're saying rather than the opposite uh, arrogant Sunni. So there's there's things that you're saying that you don't understand. Yes, they have, Shias have more problems with their theology, but and they say things that are right compared to Sunni in certain topics, not all topics. There's, there's certain understandings that they have which is correct, and there's some certain understandings that Sunni that's correct. Sunni, theologically, aqidah-wise, they're more correct than the Shia. But the Shia are more practical in their aqidah than the other side. But if we're just talking aqidah, no, I would have to remove the aqidah of the Sunnism's mentality. If I defeated it, I defeated anything lesser than that. But if I'm going to talk about practicalism and how we're going to be practical in the way we approach things, then I would have to compete with the Shia, not with the Sunni. Because the Sunni sits at home and says, don't talk about your leader. That's the difference. So you please, don't come here and start throwing things at me. Dragons, are, mm, anyways, this man, he has his Lord. If his Lord. Are you married? And if so, how did you meet? I'm not married. I'm not trying to get married. I don't want to get married in heaven, inshallah. I've, I have a purpose I would like to achieve. And and I did have a certain history. I already maybe expressed a little bit. Uh, certain times I was in political problems. Uh, certain times I was close to a certain industry where if you had a wife, you, she would be targeted and it would be a lot harder. The last ayah is 10 words. Why? But either you say it or not. I'm not, I'm not going to... The way thought you pray it spread through books not a single one of them who's a sunni learned how to pray because of hadith they all prayed because someone showed them how to pray no one learned books of prayer and for the first 200 years 300 years there was no book on prayer okay there were segments of what people did in the prayer and i want to show you a hadith about prayer from uh Muwatta malik i didn't really want to do all this but uh like this is what we need to put to the side so i'm answering you so that just so that hopefully you'll be like you know what this man understands what he's talking about uh so let's just assume that he's a muslim and whatever differences we have on the day of judgment we're gonna figure it out but as of now i have yet to tell you to to go against anybody from your own sect i'm still telling you to Instead of keep dividing and accusing people of labels, labels that don't exist in the Quran, let's unify. That's my message here. Uh, okay, so here's here's a here's a clear clear hadith for you. Uh, ta -ta -ta. Let me just find it. There it is. This is about uh, this is by Malik Imam Malik, which I, I appreciate Imam Malik. But here's the hadith. So. Yahya related to me from Malik, from his paternal uncle, Abu Suhail ibn Malik, that his uncle's father, okay, so Malik, his paternal uncle, his paternal uncle, that his uncle's father, that would be Malik's grandfather at this point, okay, I recognize nothing nowadays of what I saw the people, the companions of the messengers, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, doing except the call to prayer. So the actual Sahaba of the Prophet later is saying, I don't recognize anything that they're doing because they're not doing what we used to do. But the only thing that I'm finding consistent is the call to the prayer. So when you're saying, how do you pray? How do you pray? However you're praying, it's not how the Sahaba prayed. Because the Sahaba themselves, by the time Imam Malik is around, they're saying to him, Malik, like the, his uncle is saying, like his grandfather, his dad, his Malik's uncle's dad used to say, Malik's uncle's dad used to say, I don't recognize what these people are doing. So where where do you get your 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 your, your from so and so? This is where you got your idea. It's from so and so. I don't need so and so. I can understand what the book is telling me, and I'm performing what I need to do. And you can see, alhamdulillah, what God has given me is much better than what you have. I'm talking about theology. I'm not talking about material things. I am understanding the world in a way where you do. I'm telling you what Solomon said. If you if you're getting upset, I'm like, oh people, look, I, I've I've been given a huge favor from my Lord. 
I'm able to produce music. I'm able to go online. I have a platform. I'm talking about theology. People who are talking about theology who are wrong and crazy, they don't, they don't they're, they're, it's very clear. So um, let me see you now. Maybe, no, nope, no, nope, camera's still going. So obviously there's a huge favor of God and God does not guide the wrongdoers. What more do you want from me? I have to dive into your books just because of the questions you guys ask. Uh, ba -ba -ba, Hassan al -Nas. I told him the way he's taught is spread through countless of books. Yeah, Quran, one book unified the community and then 30 books divided it. Could you describe your purpose? My purpose is to make the world a better place. Inshallah. That is my purpose. Some Quranists claim that Masjid al Haram, Bayt al Haram is not Mecca. But that's, yeah, that's nonsense. That's all nonsense. That is nonsense. The Masjid al Haram is in Mecca. That is something that's very clear. That is not something that is easy to tamper with. And God is not going to play and tamper with us when something is very. Uh, Jerusalem is Jerusalem al Aqsa. That's something that's also very clear. That's not something that's going to be tampered with. They know the prayer like they know their sons. Where is, where, where are these people? Uh, sure, I'm not sure what you're saying. Prayer is absorbed from culture around them. The Jews learn from their pagans, neighbors, Muslims, maybe too. You guys want to see a nice? Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot this. Uh, I'm gonna show you something uh, uh, like a uh, this prayer. Uh, let me let me know if you guys uh, recognize it. Okay, let me know if you guys recognize this. And remember, a lot of the people who wrote your hadith books, they came from Jewish backgrounds, by the way. They are people who allegedly, some of them have actually accepted the message and some of them were just your enemies. But um, here, what does this look like to you guys? Here, here, ready? You guys ready for this? Boom. What's he doing? What's he doing? It sounds like he's praying with his arms up and all this. But this is what happens now because of X being under Zion's control. Which deviant sect places their hands in prayer like this Jew? You guys keep asking me, how do I pray? How do I pray? Because if someone puts his hand up here, he's a deviant. He went off the minhaj. This guy is going to hell. God's not accepting his prayer. How dare you? How dare you? So stupid. Silly. Silly. Do you know how many times I was, I was asked, me and my, my, my brother uh, Musa and my sister Yera, are you guys Muslims? Because we pray. When we pray, we put our hands down. We don't put our hands up like they do. And Imam Malik, as they love Malik, Imam Malik, he used to, yeah, yeah, like he, he used to put his hands down. But apparently, we're not Muslims for doing it. Are you guys Shia for doing that? <laughs> no, it's just, it makes more sense to put your hand down because you're at attention. But if you, if you do put your, if you are putting your hand together, it's usually when you're reciting, by the way, because obviously I'm like, you know, it's easier for me to hold my hands together and recite because that way I can control my uh, my abs and my whole like chest when I'm singing. And you can see singers sometimes they like they put their hands in, because when you're squeezing your hand, it's easier to produce your voice, right? Like you're you're holding it down, you're using your abs at that point when you're when you're reciting. So it's very easy for the imam to hold his hands and use his voice, but it does not necessarily for the person behind him to do it. Like, anyways, anyways, he asked us how to pray, but like, if you don't, all right, can we, you guys have any other questions other than, uh, okay, 9.37. Prove me Mecca is there. 9.37. Let's see, Tobi. Mm, Tobi is right here. Split the Why are we? Skip. That's Toby. Uh, which one are we talking about? 37. 36. Here's 37. Yeah, the the people who are manipulating and adding a month, making it 13 month in a year, those are the people who were uh, causing problems. That is no longer the case. And if you think that this was happening later and this is why Ramadan is off, this is not true. Show me the ground wall from Ibrahim as he built the wall. What? 
uh, Salam, honestly, these questions and what you're bringing forth, you can sit there and whatever, if you're going to say that Mecca is not where it is because you do not have definite proof, whatever you're going to come up as where it could be, you're still going to be in the same position as where you're putting me in, where it's speculative, it's speculation, it's an assumption. So me going with what God has already revealed to the majority of the world, then, then, uh, uh, then, then that, that that's the case for everybody, right? But I mean, that's the that's the closest to what would be the truth. To hide a whole city after fourteen hundred years, it's not an easy task. Ah, uh, there's a delay. Sorry. Why? Because whatever evidence you're going to be presenting is speculative evidence. Because whatever evidence that I'm going to give you that Mecca is Mecca, you're going to say, well, that's your assumption. That, but. God, to move a city, that means you would have to kill everybody in that city and in that surrounding city and everybody that knew that city. Like if I if I go right now, let's say go back 1400 years and I move a city where there was, let's say, a population of 10,000 people and people every year came to that city. People constantly every year came to that city. If I completely destroy that city and completely hide it and put it somewhere else, Someone's, someone around that area is going to be like, hey, wait a minute, there used to be a city somewhere else. And then that message would get spread and it would have shreds of documents and shreds of evidence of its movement. This is not the case. What are the arguments to use against Sunnis who say the Quran says to obey God and obey the messengers? Simply obeying the Quran, obeying the messenger. Yes, that's the simple truth. Obeying God is a lot more than just obeying the Quran. If you put your hand in the fire, it burns you. So you don't put your hands in the fire. Who's the one who programmed that? God. So those are the words of God. God has made it very clear to you in the world on what happens and what doesn't happen and how you should act. God said that if you obey the messenger, you have obeyed God. Right? This is the messenger. This is what the messenger gave you. This is what the messenger is telling. This is the message. Right? So this is you obeying God and obeying the messenger. And I have a few videos on my channel discussing this very... A specific thing so the prophet himself used to judge with the quran the prophet himself used to remind with the quran the prophet himself extracted his wisdom from the quran therefore this is where the messenger was coming from so this is how you obey messenger obeying god is obeying the book and obeying what's also been revealed to you around you in your world okay so if you have a good feeling when you feed people who programmed that good feeling therefore you should go for the good feeling and feed more people this is you obeying your god right you flooring your car and making the tires spin and your car is going out of control and you're almost gonna hit the wall and hurt yourself then you should obey your god and you keep the car on track by staying within its limits this is all forms of obeying god god clearly said in the quran that the if the oceans were multiplied by seven or if the trees were uh pens and the oceans was ink the words the, the drops of the oceans would run out, but the words of God would not run out. This is only 604 pages. Okay? And this is not, not going to even fulfill a cup of water of ink. You understand what I'm saying? So, so God's word is a lot more than the Quran. Here's the other thing. The Torah is a book of God. The Torah is the word of God. So that's clearly uh, more words than just the Quran. Are you from the USA? No, I am not from the USA. I cannot reveal my position or my my location is just because obviously you can see what I'm talking about. It upsets a lot of people, but uh, I travel the world a lot, so I go from country to country. From Bosnia, my brother, love the work you do, man, and love those state of the community streams. Alhamdulillah, thank you, brother Mirza. Glad I was able to see one live and not just the recording after. I'm glad, brother. I appreciate it, guys. I really like that uh, you guys are coming here. I think this is a good place for us to start talking. I hope you guys also, you know, honestly, like my, my goal is for you guys to to start performing. I'm going to use a word that people don't like to hear. Some jihad. Yes, striving. I want you to strive in the name of God. Strive with your with your uh, with with your internet, with your money, with yourselves, with anything. Try to bring people together. Start, people are always talking. Write a book, make a song, make a video. Uh, send a message to somebody reach out to your family make some money and give it to the poor people make a commitment to god make a covenant with god trade with god 
God, please help me with this case and let me get this so that I could do this with it in your name. And you will see that God answers you. But making a covenant means that there's these things I won't God, I won't do. This. God, if you give me money, I won't do this with this money and I will do with this with this money in your name. So this is what I want you to do. So like this is why I'm doing this. Not just for you to sit on YouTube all day and 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 uh and not do Brate Moj. Uh Brate's brother. I don't know what Moj is. Thanks for thanks for answering. I hope that was it. Not a problem, Salah. Muttaqeen means those who are awake, aware. Taqwa is aware. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless you do, mandated. Al-Muttaqeen. Yeah. Taqwa is awareness. So when God says, okay, so in Allah yuhibbu al-Muttaqeen, right? When God is saying, in Allah yuhibbu al-Mutatahireen, in Allah yuhibbu al-Muhsineen, in Allah, so God loves the righteous. God loves those who are aware. God loves those who are uh, who are clean. And then God says, God doesn't like those who deceive. God doesn't like those who betray. God doesn't like those who are doubtful. Whatever God is saying that he likes, and whatever God's saying that he doesn't like or he doesn't love, you, because you have a part of God's soul, you also don't like and like what God said he likes and he doesn't like. This is something that is very clear. God said that he likes mutalahirin. He likes cleanliness. So when you walk into a place and it's a dirty, you're like, ew, no, I don't want to be here. If you look at the reviews of places, the first one of the first things that people review is its cleanliness. And when someone is aware of you being there and he's being, he's being courteous, like if I'm driving my car and I could see you on my mirror and I move for you a little bit and you recognize that I move for you, you like that. You like when people are recognizing you and are aware that you are there as well. So as God said that God likes those that are aware, you also like when people are aware. Okay? Because uh, not sometimes you don't want to talk. Sometimes you just, like, you, you rather the person just notices. This is the people who are aware. God says that he doesn't like those backstabbers. You don't like backstabbers. This is, these are some stuff that in the Quran that if you really dive in and you understand, then you realize what you need to do and you shouldn't do. So whatever God likes, then when you do it, other people will like you because it's human nature. That's futra at this point. Salam alaikum, bros. Salam alaikum. Uh, trevia salat is a little bit too much in my opinion. I do it sometimes, but Omar really did a number there. I'm not sure. Tarawih, I think is what you're talking. Tarawih. Tarawih. Uh, technically, me and my like I'm my brother Musa. He's a he's a how can I say he's a marathon. Uh, prayer he's a marathon runner in prayer so we 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 sometimes don't have a problem standing two three four hours a night praying because the night prayer is amazing like if you really dedicate yourself to the night prayer when you're feeling low or you're feeling disconnected from god or you're feeling far away from god you spend that much time in the quran and prostration and you get emotional with god you talk to god the night prayer is an amazing prayer Subhanallah, I sound like a hypocrite because it's it, it is almost a, a, the end of the night where I'm at. So yeah, the night prayer is very amazing. All right, guys, I am gonna wrap this up. It's been two hours. Uh, I hope you guys are liking these, as I said. And uh, inshallah, we'll see you in the next episode. I'm not sure when it's gonna be. Uh, I I would like to keep a consistent schedule. That's not something that's easy for me. Because you could see from the background that I was in where I was last time. And now the things have changed a little bit because I'm not in the same place. And uh, and you could see my videos from the last two years for now. My background constantly keeps changing. Alhamdulillah. This is from um, the grace of my God. I have to say, man, your take on Islam is the closest I've seen to mine. Alhamdulillah. I don't accept this hadith authority. I look at it as a historical context. And as long as it aligns with the Quran, I don't accept uh, but I don't see it having an impact on my salvation. That's 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 the truth. So you don't need hadith to find God to be guided and to do what you do. If hadith is around, hadith is around. Is it necessary for guidance? No, it is. Is it around? Yes, it's around. But here's the thing. This is what I do. This is how I started to approach the matter. I have my interpretations that I received from the Quran. 
Do I find anyone else from their books that said the same things? If I say it, then I say like, hey, like this is my interpretation. And here you go. This guy that you guys love, Imam Malik Tabari, said the exact same things which you don't accept at this point. So like, why am I crazy if Malik and Tabari, which you guys love, are saying the exact same thing that I'm saying right now? But then it'll be like, oh, well, you're, you're getting it from the Hadith. No, I'm not. I got it from the book, just like how they got it from the book. And I'm using your own books as proof that other people in history reached the same conclusions that I did purely from the book. Alhamdulillah. So this is how I approach uh, hadith sometimes. But uh, honestly, uh, thank you, Joseph. I appreciate it. But honestly, like, I don't... Some of the stuff that you read in hadith, it hurts your heart. It really hurts your heart. There's one where they say that, like, this is sahih, they say that God is... Uh, embarrassed god gets embarrassed yes if you call upon god and you open your hands god gets embarrassed to not answer you astaghfirullah alazim the prophet would never say some stuff like that today i was reading that uh eve betrayed her husband if it wasn't eve betraying her husband then wives would not betray their men like what when did eve betray her husband oh when she ate the apple and whoever said that hadith was a Jew because that's the Jewish narration in Quran the devil whispered to both of them guess who said that narration our favorite hadith reciter Abu Huraira the Jew completely agree my brother thanks Marzal so Abu Huraira the Jew if you see his hadith you go put that in the garbage very quickly uh, there's also hadith where they used to be considered strong is hijab mandatory hijab is good for you Hijab is good for you. Uh, I would I would classify that as yes, but uh, if you don't wear it, it does not necessitate that you are not a Muslim or that you have left the fold of Islam, but you're going to go through the pain of not wearing a hijab. But hijab is definitely something you should be doing. Hijab is khumar, khumar for me is hijab because it's something that's on the head. I know people want to say that it's a veil, but the fact that it's called khamr, khimar, it's from the head. I understand that people who are uh, Quran alone, they like to be very liberal. Uh, there is some stuff to me. It's, it Naturally, for the human society, it does make sense because it keeps things in lock. The more a girl reveals herself, the more the, the men gets sexualized, the more objectified the women becomes, the, the more empty and diseased they both get does not mean that it just starts with her removing her headscarf. She removes her headscarf, cool. She wants to show her hair, fine. She wants to put extra makeup, now we're going a little bit weird. Now she wants to show the top of her chest, you're crossing limits. Any tips for learning Arabic? I started and it's really challenging. I'm starting and it's really challenging. But uh, the niqab is, that's different. Niqab is different. Even though, here's the weird part. For me, when I see a girl in a niqab and I just see her eyes, my brain automatically fills like the gap that she's beautiful. I don't know why. I think that every girl that you know niqab to me, she just not like in my head. Like, she just looks beautiful because I don't know how she looks like. That's that's the only weird thing about niqab. But you know, I don't think niqab is is something that is must. God said to cover. So the more you cover, the closer you are to the truth. The less you cover, the more pain you're gonna get. Compare a girl in a full niqab compared to a girl with in a two piece bikini. Who's going to go through more pain in the world, right? One is completely isolated and people don't really give her much attention, which is fine if that if she's fine with that, alhamdulillah. And she's able to protect herself more. And then the other one, she's going to get caught cold the whole time and she's going to go through a lot of pain and people are going to picture her in their head later. And this is actually something that does affect a girl's spirituality, just so you know. People, uh, this is, I'm not going to get into much details, but this is some stuff that they do in Hollywood where they do uh, desecrate each other in their minds. So, And this is voodoo and all sorts of nonsense does this as well. He just uses it for historical reference. As hadith, yes. Uh, honestly, I don't, I, I, I talk theology because I love explaining the Quran. I just don't like talking about sectarianism. Unfortunately, there's a monopoly by a certain sect on the Quran, so you have to deal with them. But if you guys realize my last few times, I, I just don't like talking about that. I don't. I just, it's a, 
it's a waste of energy at certain times talking about what needs to be done and uniting people and and the, the general population the common muslim that's walking in the streets in the middle east they don't know any of it they believe in sahih and muslim but they've never read them they don't know they just told to believe it so they believe it they know prayer zakat hajj uh, psalm fasting that's how far oh be good to your parents and pray on the prophet that's there in that, to me that person i can get along with more than someone who's coming to me and saying hey bro you need to like put your hands like that when you're like no nah, bro like just leave me alone <laughs> you know arabic is there a really big difference between it and the english or other translations okay so for me when i am translating verses I personally, I have to jump around a few translations so that I could get the idea that I found off the, the Quran. You, you don't find translations that are very consistent with each other, but they're all trying to give you the same image. So what I try to do is, for example, there's the great Quran by Shu'aib Abdullahi. That's a good translation. Uh, he tries to stick to the text as much as he can. There are things that I don't agree with him there. I would go as well and look at Saf, Safi Qasqas. He has a good translation. And then from the sectarians, I would go with Sahih International, which is just because it's on corpus. And then I would also go with Muhammad Asad. Those are like usually the translations I look at. But uh, there's IslamicAwaken.com. He puts a bunch of translations for you to see. But if you want to learn the Arabic, I would recommend you start with the letters, obviously. You, uh, MSA is different than Quranic Arabic. Yes, they're both Arabic, but the structure of the sentence is different. And the uh, word choice is a little different. But alhamdulillah, you can still learn MSA that would help you with the reading the Quran. And you start reading the Quran. Um, yes, there's definitely a different understanding in Arabic. So you need to just start recognizing the letters. You start reading it. After you start reading it, you start reading the uh, the the. So the for me the best Quran would be and my sister uh, my sister L. Okay, let's just say uh, my sister L. She she has a Quran where it's the Arabic with the words the translation of the word right under it. And she she's not an Arabic speaker. But she learned how to read. She read the Qur'ans, and congratulations to her. She's doing an excellent job. And then she's now recognizing the words, but she's working hard on it. So whatever you work hard on, as long as you start taking the steps forward, I promise you, you're, you're going to, you're going to, it's going to be a struggle at the beginning, and then it becomes easier. But you have to, you have to work. Allah will teach you with the pen. It's very true. Do you believe that praying in the language other than Arabic? No, you can pray in whatever language you want. Because the point is to dive into the Quran. So, yes, the Arabic gives you the clearest picture because it's an Arabic book. But if you put a translation and you're reading the translation and thinking about what's being said and relating it back to you and glorifying your God and speaking to your God through the book at the same time, that is what the prayer is. So, uh, okay, Diana, I will talk about Sam Gerens very shortly. Sam Gerens, to me, he is a person who is striving. He is doing his best to wake up the masses, especially the people in the West. Unfortunately, he has a few ideas that I definitely don't agree with. Uh, that's why I don't really recommend his work to people. Um, a few of his footnotes is incorrect. A few of his translations is off. Uh, it's purely because of the grammatical Arabic. I can use the word duty, which he uses for salah, and put that for siyam. I can use that for zakat. Uh, it does not necessitate it, the idea of removing a ritual prayer is incorrect. That there's definitely ritual prayers in the Quran, and the world is not flat. So that's that. And the more delusions, I'm not saying that he's delusional, the more incorrect things, misguided things of interpretations that you receive, the further you are from the truth, the, f the more psychological issues you might find in your life. I'm not saying it's crazy or anything, but this is the, this is the ultimate truth. If the closer you are to the truth, the more peace you find. And the more things that you have incorporated to you, the, the less loyal you are to God at this point, and therefore you, you, there's more of an authority of the devil over you, so you might have certain thoughts. So God brought the book, and he brought the scale. So there's disbeliever and there's believer and there's a scale in between. 
So now nobody's 100% a believer and nobody's 100% a disbeliever. They're on a scale. So here's the truth and here's the lie. If you're closer to the truth, you're going to have the benefits of being that close to the truth. And if you're closer to the lie, you're going to have the disadvantages of being that close to the lie. So if Sam Guerin's translation, it's close to the truth. But because of the stuff that he added, which was not close to the truth, it brought him closer to the lie. So he's going to have that little disadvantage. He himself, I understand he's striving and we can have discussions. But it's at this point between me and him, he's already set in his way. Right. If he wants to change his methodology or change his understanding, that's beneficial for him. But I know I won't, and I I believe he won't either. So, what's the earth in the Quran? The Quran does not specify the shape of the earth. The Quran is ambiguous on the shape. Where if we talk about a flat earth, it would fit all the verses, and if we talk about a round round earth, it would fit all the earth. Lard is ard is earth. Dunya is dunya is like the closer hayat to dunya the closer life uh sorry if the jewish messiah does not come back what would you say the punishment has such down evil there is no messiah is coming back no jesus is coming back no messiah is going to be created they're just uh, going through a lot of assumptions and and they might cut the uh last lock uh they might cut the cow nothing happens and they're gonna feel like idiots so maybe god is letting them cut the cow and then that's it what if uh, i mean in mean where is written the earth is round the quran does not talk about the shape of the earth the quran does not outright explicitly tell you the shape of the earth it is not mentioned it's on a need to know basis so you, you as a believer it does not change whether the earth is a trapezoid flat or round it's not something that is necessary for your religion so it's not discussed and everything that they're trying to present as it being flat it also works in in uh in a spherical nature all the words that they're using tabaqat so the, they use tabaqat they say levels so it's level well we have tabaqat so the electrons have uh valence shells they have electric levels we use the same word tabaqat but we very know that it's a ball it's not a Flat. Mm, uh, pa, pa, pa. Uh, what is the earth in sorry the world is the dunya world yeah you could say world is dunya i think yeah guys that's it subhanallah well i appreciate you guys coming around uh i, I, uh, I appreciate you guys coming around assalamu alaikum and we'll see you guys uh, anytime soon any issues with mentioning the Prophet in the Sunni Shahada? Well, why don't you mention Jesus as well? well why are we mentioning just Muhammad? Wait, we, we, we can't. Yes, you can testify that Prophet Muhammad is a messenger. And this is in the last chapter in verse 13. Okay, so if you go to chapter 13 and you go to the last verse, uh, say, they say, oh, you're not a messenger. Uh, say, God is sufficient between me and you as a witness that I'm a messenger, obviously, and whoever has been given knowledge is a book. So I can witness that Prophet Muhammad is a messenger because of the book that I have. But do I have to say it to be a Muslim? Absolutely not. Do I have to constantly keep saying it? No, you don't. Because I shahadu anna la ilallah wa shahadu anna Musa Rasulullah. So there we go. I, Moses, I, you, if you don't say that, you're a kafir. No, that's nuts. But uh, there's also a book by Fred M. Boner, I believe, uh, where he shows you historically that at the beginning it was a singular shahada and then it became shahadatain after they conquered Jerusalem or close to the time they conquered Jerusalem. So, okay, guys, appreciate you to coming. Uh, inshallah, tomorrow, not tomorrow, sorry, the next, uh, the next uh, episode will be soon. And um, stay safe, inshallah. You guys uh, hopefully find something to do to present to God for your day of judgment. And peace be upon you all.